Good morning and um, welcome everybody to OARC 33. Um, before we um, start proceedings, uh, I just have a few administrative items that I'd like to go through. I'm Keith Mitchell, uh, OARC um, president. Um, here's a few things to bear in mind. It's an online event. So um, please remember that the DNS work conduct policy applies online just as much as it does at uh, physical events. Uh, when you registered for this or when you signed up as an award member, you agreed to be bound by that. So please um, respect that and give everybody a good experience. The meeting is being recorded and all the talks will be available on the award YouTube channel after the event. Um, we're in webinar mode, which means that during the event, non-speakers are muted. Um, all the event times are in UTC. Um, and um, for general discussion during an interaction during the meeting, we will be using um, our, our new Mattermost platform. Social media tag, my hashtags are hashwork online, hashwork 33. We introduced the Mattermost platform for work 32A, our first online workshop. There's been great interest and take up in that. 230 users have signed up. Um, it's easy to sign up for public or member access. Um, we'll be doing the general workshop discussion in the workshop community channel. Um, you should be able to use your web browser or their downloadable clients from most, from most platforms, but we, we're now using that completely instead of previous use of Jabber. Questions. For questions and answers, we will be using entirely the Zoom Q&A mechanism. So if you have a question, there's at least five minutes at the end of each, each speaker, uh, 10 minutes for the longer talks uh, for Q&A. So use the Zoom Q&A panel to answer your question in text. Um, it will be read out by one of our chairs to the speaker. Um, please identify yourself and affiliation when asking. If you need help with the workshop, then um, either do that in the Mattermost channel or you can use the raise hand in, in, in the workshop. Trying something new in the break today. Uh, talk to OARC. Um, we're doing this two ways. Um, Jerry Lundstrom will be doing a software development, Ask Me Anything, um, in the Zoom meeting room. Uh, that's the Zoom meeting room number. We'll share the password or you should have received that by email. Um, our membership coordinator, Sue Graves, will be answering questions about OARC membership. Now, that might be for an existing OARC member and there's something you want to ask about, or it might be that you're, you're interested in joining. Um, anyway, that's the introductory material. Um, I will now um, for those of you who have um, not been to an award meeting before, or maybe you only went to one of our short online ones, I just want to run through uh, a few introductory things about ORC itself. Um, we have a mission. I think this mission is more relevant during um, the weird year that we find ourselves in than ever. Um, we have a unique opportunity to collect data on the uh, very interesting and unusual inflection point or event or exception, however you want to regard it, that has happened as everyone's lives has started running everything on the internet. We've been gathering data through that. We have researcher interest. There's definitely um, some lessons to be learned there. We're still offering the same services and tools that we all we did and also new ones like Mattermost um, to help coordinate uh, the community. Um, and you know, we have relationships that we've established over a long time and it, it, these relationships become even more important when we can't all see each other face to face. Um, there's some interesting things happening. Um, we have ways of sharing information, not disinformation amongst our, our, our community. Generate knowledge transfer. We're still organizing the workshops and it's great to see that we have 150 people registered for this one. Um, so if this is your first to work workshop, welcome. Um, and, um, and yeah, it's very important while everyone conducts their life online that they, they realize the, the, the things that underpin that and support it, um, such as the DNS. Um, this is our member community. We've had some nice um, additions and upgrades. Um, the other thing is that our members have been absolutely solid in supporting us this year. And we're very grateful for that. Um, technical resources. Uh, we have our data catalog, more about that tomorrow. Um, core infrastructures in Fremont, California. Um, we have storage and analysis servers for member use. We have a very large suite of open source DNS tool software. We've been expanding that. We've also been doing some um, analysis and review of that this year to, to make it more robust. 
um, speed of active DNS test services, and we don't just have a single failure point in California, we have infrastructure in other parts of the world as well. These are membership categories. Most of our support comes from membership. Um, I strongly ask you to consider signing up or upgrading. Um, uh, we believe there is, there, there is value in that. What kind of entity are we? Uh, we're independent. We have a very diverse base of members. It's not just um, DNS operators, it's DNS vendors, open source software um, providers, um, ISPs, cloud providers. Um, we're financially self-supporting, usually about three quarter of a million, um, roughly break even every year to fulfill our nonprofit remit. Um, we're self-governing, we're neutral, um, the board is elected every year, um, reflecting the member interests. We'll be conducting our AGM and board elections tomorrow. Uh, we have a handful of staff that perform the work under contract, and we have a huge um, cohort of volunteers, in particular a program committee who put today's workshop together. This is our board. Um, half of the board is up for re-election tomorrow. Um, you can see they all represent various members, but they're all actually appointed in individual capacity. Here are the staff. Um, you can see we're pretty geographically diverse and that's nothing new. We've been doing that since the work started. So we were able to adapt to remote working pretty easily. Um, and this is our program committee. Um, again, they do a lot of work behind the scenes to make the, um, the, 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 the content of our workshops work. Um, and um, we'll be looking for volunteers for the 2021 pro program committee tomorrow uh, between now and, uh, and over the next few weeks. So please consider stepping up if you're interested in helping out. Our next workshops, I'd love to give you a fixed timetable for these. We will definitely be having a work 34 in February. Uh, it was originally planned as a um, physical workshop in Atlanta co-located with Nanog. That will not now be happening. Um, we will be um, conducting that completely online. In 2021, we will definitely do one more long format workshop. Um, that might be fully online, it might be fully physical, more likely it will be some kind of hybrid of the two, depending on how things evolve. Um, we aim to do one, maybe two short online workshops as well, and try and keep these to a reasonably regular frequency of, of, of three months. So what is it that we do for our members in the community? It's about knowledge sharing, it's about tools, it's about platform for and services, it's about collecting data, keeping the preserving that data and sharing that data, uh, promoting collaboration um, and running our workshops. We're not just about the workshops, we're not just over the NS NOG, we do a bunch of other things which synergize with that. Um, why should you become an award member? Um, I'm, I'm not going to speak through every one of these points, but, but please consider them um, and um, enjoy the rest of the workshop and hopefully you'll be able to consider becoming an award member at the end of it if you're not already. And, and I think the, the best way that I can demonstrate value is not for me to pitch it to you, but rather uh, for the testimonials of various of our members. Um, okay, that's all you'll be hearing from me today. Um, there'll be more of the AGM tomorrow. If you are an ORC member, please remember that um, registration for the AGM is separate from ORC 33. Um, so if you want the chance to vote and attend, uh, please uh, do register for that. Um, okay, I will now hand you over um, to um, our session chair, Program Committee Chair Shumon Luke for our first, first session, um, and um, also Anand from the Program Committee. Anand will be doing the timekeeping for the, uh, for the presentations this morning. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Keith, and hi, folks. Uh, I'm Shumon, and I'll be introducing the speakers for the first set of talks today, and also uh, moderating the Q&A session. Uh, our first speaker today is Joao Damas from APNIC. He will be talking about DNS query name minimization measurement. So Joao, can you go ahead and share your slides and start speaking? Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you great. And go can ahead. you see my slides? We can see your slides too. Okay, then I'll stop the video and concentrate on the slides. So thanks for having us. This is the work we did together, Jeff and I, uh, at APNIC, uh, in measuring uh, the adoption level of query name minimization. Uh, we wanted to do 
a renew study of what we had done uh, about a year ago, because there had been a uh, speak of uh, improved rates of adoption. So I'll start with um, a quick introduction. Hold on, sorry. Um, so normally, as you see, and everyone here attending knows, uh, when you ask for a record at a name, uh, that query is repeated to all the name servers in the path uh, as they become more and more specific, even if they don't have the answer and all they do is uh, refer, refer you to the next uh, name server down the resolution chain. Um, Stefan Wortzmeier uh, came up with this idea of uh, minimizing the information leak in each DNS query by, by <laughs> keeping the name that you ask at each of these steps to a minimum. So you minimize the queue name and that's where things got the name. Uh, the idea was eventually published on um, RFC 7816. And what that does is change the queries into this other pattern where uh, only the minimal amount of information is sent as part of the queue name to each of the servers along the path. One more label than, is, uh, than the service authority for. And it recommends that uh, rather than using for the, the original uh, record, uh, for the information in between, uh, the NS record is used. That's what was published. Um, as for implementations in software, we have a list there. Um, pretty much all of the open source ones seem to have implemented these in the past at one stage or another. So with that, um, we would expect the universal adoption, uh, just like for IPv6, and uh, we will be done. So we wanted to check on that and we did a measurement. The first one uh, we did, as I mentioned earlier in 2019, the, the, the outcome is published in, uh, on Potteroo, on Jeff's normal platform. And uh, the, that's, that table uh, summarizes what we saw at the time. Overall, out of uh, almost half a billion experiments conducted uh, throughout several weeks online, uh, we saw 3% of the queries coming our way with um, using QNAME immunization. So that was very little. Um, but already there, there was a signal that was a bit odd in the fact that the recommended query NS was only accounting for 25% of those QNAME immunization queries, whereas the A record accounted for 75%. Uh, so it was three times as big as, as, as the recommended RFC query type. And there was a residual, a residual si uh, signature uh, of while they queries. Some people just like that. For 2020, we conducted this experiment over the Northern Hemisphere summer, winter back down in Australia. And we indeed saw uh, quite a change in the picture. Uh, as you see there, the, the, the adoption rate has jumped all the way from 3% uh, a year ago to 18% last month. Um, we conducted a, a smaller number of experiments because we were just wanting to verify the figures and the measurements uh, corresponding to be able to compare to last year and not do the whole thing again. Um, as you see, the query distribution pattern uh, is even more skewed towards the use of A versus NS in this, uh, with this increased adoption. Uh, and there is no residual signal of, of the usage of quad A's. So good things, um, people seem to be deploying this and uh, it's getting more use. So uh, it's a small contribution to user privacy in the network. And uh, the pattern of usage is that pretty much everyone, nine out of 10 uh, will use a, an A query in the exploration of the DNS tree rather than an S or quad A. Someone from the panel has asked me to turn on the camera. Okay, fair enough. I just did that. Um, so where are the users? Where are these users that we are seeing using this? Um, if we look by country and we look at the adoption rate uh, within each country, uh, the topmost is Andorra. Andorra is a tiny little country uh, sandwiched between Spain and um, France um, in the Pyrenees. There's not one single flat space there. And, and then uh, other smaller countries, Cyprus, um, Iran uses, I guess people there are concerned about uh, privacy and what, what the NS queries they get um, to be shown to whoever, the ISP, um, not for me to tell. 
um, interesting enough, the Democratic Republic, People's Republic of Korea shows up there, um, which personally I was surprised. And then uh, so on. Um, so none of the big, big economies uh, show up immediately there. Now, if we want to look at uh, it, uh, not by countries, but by resolvers, the resolver that is being used, um, we always come across this problem when we talk about resolvers in the experiments, which is it's increasingly hard to tell uh, with what is actually a resolver. Um, many ISPs and particularly the open resolvers scale their resources by having farms um, that are part of a, a bigger network of servers. So what we do to try to cope with this is that we aggregate um, things by slash 24s in IPv4 and slash 38s in, in IPv6 because we have seen patterns indicating that, um, for instance, Google at the sites uses use slash 24 IPv4 addresses a number a number of uh, parallel independent somewhat independent resolvers, and that they behave you you as one um, loosely coherent. They they sometimes uh, don't talk to each other internally and just ask the question, so we see repeat queries. Anyway, uh, if you look at the open resolvers, uh, we'll see these sort of results that we present on the table. Uh, Google, which we were just talking about, um, does not do human immunization at all. Um, and then there are others. Uh, there are interesting ones, and this is where it's, it's actually a pity that we don't have a physical meeting where we could, uh, go to the coffee break and uh, just chat friendly with some people because things like Cloudflare at 50% adoption to me looks quite surprising. It's like in this day of DevOps and automated deployments, one would expect 100% or nothing. Um, but perhaps this is just an interpretation of what relaxed adoption of kin immunization actually means. And they take it to mean uh, one out of every two queries. Who knows? It would be easy again you know, if we could just grab someone over a coffee break and ask that question. You can see the other ones uh, out there with different levels of adoption. Uh, with regards to resolvers run by the ISPs, there's also quite a mix. Um, Reliance Geo, which is one of the big ISPs and new mobile operators in India, uh, has a decent adoption radio, but not universal. And uh, you see others. Um, People who are typically at the forefront of DNS technology adoption, like Comcast, are surprisingly uh, not showing as having picked up this one. Perhaps um, we can encourage them. <clears throat> so uh, what we observe here is that Korean musician is gathering momentum. Uh, we jumped from 3% a year ago to 18% right now, which is good. And uh, whereas the code support is pretty much universal in the recent versions of uh, software, DNS software out there. Uh, perhaps ISPs develop, deploy these at their own rate and uh, who knows when we'll reach uh, uh, more than 50%, which would be a good thing to, to aim for. Uh, of course, every time you measure something, you come up with more questions. And these are ones that we are considering right now. Um, does it do, do what is the pattern here? Uh, are the is adoption prevalent in smaller ISPs, which are harder to measure, versus bigger ISPs? But then again, the big jumps come from uh, when adoption takes place at one of the big ones. Uh, so we'll be looking at how we can possibly discern uh, number of independent entities versus big entities, and that take a lot of users along with them. Um, a good question that uh, we think about is, um, well, is, is, the, is the privacy concern about the query name on its own, or is it the combination of recursive resolver and the query name? Uh, so if you choose your recursive resolver or a, a sample of recursive resolvers, perhaps you are less concerned about minimizing the query name. Um, we'll find out. And uh, as there were uh, struggles uh, problems with initial adoption of kidney immunization due to the handling of the internals, we would like to find out if that's still the case and where do this happen uh, at this time. So this was a short talk and uh, that is it from me. Um, if anyone has questions, I'll be glad to 
yesterday. Great, uh, thank you, Joelle. Let me uh, quickly see what questions and comments we have for you. So we have a couple. Um, the first question is from Joe Abley. Mm -hmm. And he says, what should we make of the fact that the observed behavior with Q type A is so different from that observed with Q type quad A? That's a good question because IPv6 adoption raters don't look anything like these, right? So why is there such a striking zero to 100 difference in the DNS queries? We don't know. We don't know yet. Sorry to say. Okay, thank you. And um, another one, the next one is from Paul Hoffman of ICANN, who asks, VeriSign just published a paper that shows radically higher adoption rates than what you did. They measured at the root server. Can you explain why your results are so different? So what we do measure is the behavior of end users, right? And uh, we use non-caching names. Uh, so each name is, is, is unique. It has a timestamp. It has a unique UUID as part of it. So we don't see any of the caching effects. I don't know if that might account for uh, what they see uh, as, as, as the, the, anything that might be cached is already filtered. And uh, at the root servers, you only see the, the uh, odd new ones. Uh, that's that's, that's a, a thing that we have observed uh, in, in other experiments we've conducted with uh, regards to what we observe and things people like the root servers and perhaps even the, the DLD servers sometimes see. Uh, I'll look at uh, Dwayne's paper for more details, but that's, that's the, the most plausible explanation right now. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly a difference in methodologies. I, I, so I did yeah. read that paper. I think what they're measuring is uh, the count of the number of labels that are emitted to their TLDs, right? Such as mm -hmm. two, three. So I think uh, it's a different method. It me probably measures more than QNAME minimization queries, right? Queries that were legitimately for the apex of the zone are probably counted in that number too. So right. that's my speculation about why their mm -hmm. numbers are higher. But yeah. it would probably be good for you guys to talk and, and sure. think into that a little bit more. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. And we have Joe back again for round two. <laughs> Joe, I believe this is. So he asks, what is the behavior if a local resolver with a QNAME minimization installed, but with a forwarder configured of 1.1.1.1, uh, is the result from APNIC's perspective that Cloudflare is doing minimization uh, just uh, some of the time? Um, so in that case, uh, a forwarder normally, I think, would actually do the whole, uh, the forwarded to server would do the actual resolution. It would behave either QNAME or non-QNAME minimization dep uh, depending on what the configuration is. Uh, if it is issued individual queries by someone behind it doing uh, um, QNAME minimization, feeding the forwarded one at a time, then perhaps you'd see uh, Cloudflare behaving as if it was a QNAME minimization. It's hard to tell, uh, but that would not, account for such a 50-50 uh, split in behavior. That I mean, that number is particularly unusual uh, because it's such a round number, right? Um, so there must be something else. And uh, as I said, I wish I could just tap Olafur or Martin or someone else uh, in the shoulder for a quick chat because, it, because it's a striking effect. Okay, thank you, Joao. So uh, your talk is quite popular. Questions are streaming in. So next <laughs> one is uh, Ralph Weber. He says, not a question, but as you ask why no more adoption of big resolvers, the answer still is if your server has 100,000 users, QNAME minimization does not give you much, but has a potential downside, more requests to authoritative servers. Yes, that is true. And perhaps that's what we're trying to, to hint at with the, is this a problem with this name by itself or a combination of the name and the resolver? Perhaps some people feel that if you can mask, mask or hide in the crowd, and then you're safe enough. Right. Okay, next we have uh, Peter van Dijk. Uh, also not a question, but a partial answer. Unbound always emits A queries while doing QNA minimization. I believe PowerDNS does the same. That way the Q type of the original query 
is not leaked upstream. I believe the uh, biz QNA minimization RFC also suggests A over NS. Right. Yeah. And that's what we see uh, in the adoption of the, how the queries are done. Yep. Uh, next, we have Giovanni Mora. Uh, comment. I posted on Mattermost, but now I can see questions can be sent here. <laughs> I guess I didn't need to read that part. Comment. So Google <laughs> turned on QNA minimization in December of 2019. And we did notice that uh, in .nl as, and .nz as well. Uh, Wes's presentation today will show that. That's a presentation coming up actually um, uh, very soon. Awesome. Oh, well, that, that uh, comes to show that the frequency of sampling we measured last year and then again this year, um, things can happen in between. <laughs> and so Google probably turned it on and off um, in between our measurements. Okay, good. I'll, uh, I'll talk to Google too. I'm curious why they, they decided to turn it off. So Eric uh, Morbobia, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly, asks, uh, what in your opinion would fast track adoption of QNA minimization to a higher percentage in the year or next year? Uh, clearly, if uh, a, a few of the big players were to be convinced that this is beneficial, that would make a humongous difference. How you go about uh, convincing them, uh, I'm not sure. And particularly in view of the uh, discussion we just had with the previous answer about Google turning enough, um, they must have had a reason. Uh, I'll probably go and ask them uh, what was their concern. Okay. Um, and now we have, uh, there's a comment from Phil uh, Regno saying beneficial for who? Um, what is beneficial for who? The yeah, I'm trying to figure out think. <laughs> <laughs> so Phil, if you could elaborate on your question and what you're referring to, which comment you're referring to specifically, that would help, but I'll move on to the next question. So this yeah, is Puni Tsud from Google uh, is following up and says, Google Public DNS has been, been doing QNA minimization since March of 2020. And to follow up on that, he asked, can you confirm the QNA minimization is being done at TLDs or within a delegated zone? Uh, so it's your measurement target, right? Yeah, it's being done with a uh, within a delegated zone. Uh, we have uh, we have a domain that we publish, and that's within that subtree of the DNS was, is where we force uh, the DNS behaviors that we want to measure. So it's not at the PLD level. We don't have access to PLD information. Um, Surprised you said because you didn't. We didn't see any. Uh, fingerprint from uh, Google doing this. Um, and this was done after March. So, hmm, interesting. Hmm. Okay, and I think we have one more question from a fellow panelist, actually. So this is from Petr Spacek. Uh, says, uh, various resolvers implement different workarounds, which might explain weird adoption rates. Could you elaborate about the method to measure QNIM minimization adoption? Right, so what we do is we delegate uh, names and we place uh, empty non-terminals in between uh, and we observe distinct, we delegate this uh, increasing number of levels to different name servers and we see what is the pattern of query, who comes around querying for the complete name or each of the partial names or um, who is able to detect that one of the labels is actually an empty non terminal and whether they fall off the edge of the planet when they, when they do that or are able to continue. So we basically run uh, the name servers throughout the resolution path, uh, starting at the anchor name for our um, base domain and, and look at who comes back and how they come back. Okay, good. All right. So I think we're almost out of time, but Phil has uh, elaborated on his prior question about beneficial. He says, Joao was saying the large operators would turn on QNA minimization if it were found to be beneficial. Since it increases the amount of authoritative queries, who would benefit from having it enabled? Is privacy a concern enough for the large operators or does enabling QNA minimization hinder data gathering? Well, it does seem that data gathering, that's the whole point of the exercise, right? Um, who does it benefit? It depends who you think uh, the internet service providers work for. Um, 
if they are providing internet service, presumably to someone, um, then making the better the, the service better for that someone uh, who is paying you the the money might be what an ISP would uh, normally do. Um, we all know that's not necessarily true, but maybe I'm uh, a little bit naive and like things the way they used to be. Okay. All right, great. Th thank you again, uh, Joao, for a very interesting presentation. You can go ahead and stop sharing now and we'll move on to our uh, next talk. And this is uh, Rafaele Sommese from the University of Twente. He will be speaking about orphan and abandoned glue records in DNS top level domains. So Rafaele, the stage is yours. Go ahead and uh, show your slides and start speaking. Okay, can you see my slides and can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can see your uh, slides. Your voice is a little faint, uh, but we can hear you. Can you hear me better now? Okay, that's much better. Okay, perfect. Go ahead. So, uh, today I'm going to talk to you about these uh, orphan and abandoned records problem that we discovered. I'm Rafael Sumez, a PhD student at the University of Twente, and this work is a, a collaboration between uh, uh, University of Twente and Kaida under the Madviper project. And it was presented at the WTMC uh, workshop in, uh, in Genoa this year. Um, so uh, let's introduce the argument. Uh, DNS zone administration is a complex task basically involving several entities. Uh, in fact, in the context of DNS, we can typically identify three types of stakeholders, which are uh, registry, registrar, and registrant. And uh, due to com the complexity of managing the DNS information, uh, what we have is that uh, misconfiguration and error can basically occur. Uh, in this work, we present an analysis on a specific type of misconfiguration that we define as, uh, that is defined as orphan record. Uh, before introducing orphan records, let's talk about glue record. Uh, generally speaking, top level domain, is a special type of zone which has the only responsibility of delegate authority for second level domains. And the delegation uh, is performed using NS record. Uh, but if an NS record for a domain points to a record that is inside the domain, so we, we call that uh, this condition as in belly weak, uh, that name is uh, included in the zone as glue record to enable the resolution process to continue. And glue records are usually the only A quadruple A records admitted to top level domains on file. Uh, if we look to a well format zone, but for example, we have a thisgood.com and we have the NS record that points to ns1.good.com. So we have a glue record that is ns1.good.com that, that points to uh, an IP address. And this is basically ns1.good.com is a glue record. Um, if you look also to the to domain life cycle of the uh, uh, of the, the the usual life cycle of a domain, we see that the domain is uh, usually available. Then someone registers this domain, we you can renew this domain for a certain amount of time. After the, some period, this domain will expire. We have we will have a period of uh, redemption, and then this domain is marked for deletion and is deleted. So now we can introduce orphan. Uh, what is orphan? Orphan uh, records are basically former glue records for which the related domain does not exist anymore in the zone. That means that the delegation has been removed, uh, uh, but the record is still there. So uh, these records are supposed to be removed after the delegation is removed or changed, but we discovered that this, this is not always the case. Uh, what, we do, what we do in this work, we basically reproduce and extend an analysis performed 10 years ago by Calafut et al. in an IMC paper, and we asked ourselves, a decade after uh, these original studies, what the, these orphan records phenomenon look like? Uh, we characterize uh, this phenomenon on a data set of uh, around 2K top level domains and on time window of 25 months, and uh, we also discover a related type of misconfiguration, which we call abandoned records. What is abandoned records? Abandoned records are former glue records for which the uh, related domain still exists in the zone, but the delegation no longer requires that glue record. So abandoned records do not show up in the DNS resolution. They are only returned in additional section when they are referred by other delegation in the zone. So just a quick recap. Uh, NS, uh, here I report basically an example, hypothetical.com zone, and we have these ns1.expired1.com and ns1.expired2.com. These two are orphan records because expired1.com and expired2.com does not exist in the zone. So these two domains are not in the zone. 
Uh, instead for ns1.example.com, we see that we have this example.com uh, um, that point with the ns record to ns.external.org. So it is not required anymore by example.com that ns1.example.com. So what we found in, uh, in our analysis, we found around 88,000 orphan records and 1 million abandoned records in the zone file on daily average. Uh, we found that in the, the .info zone is responsible alone for half of these orphan records, around 44,000 uh, orphan records, and basically show also the highest percentage of orphan among the total number of e record in the zone. We found also many orphans in uh, .org and a new general top-level domain that was introduced actually after the, the original study. Uh, and uh, uh, we found also that uh, uh, abandoned records instead are most prevalent in .com and .org. Um, we study also the lifetime of these abandoned records to try to understand how long these orphan records survive. And for orphan, we found that 19% uh, uh, survive just one day. So they are just transient records that are published in the zone. Uh, however, uh, for 4% uh, of all the records that we, we analyzed, that are around 21,000 records, we found that they persisted more than 760 days, that is the, basically all the period of our analysis, meaning that this represents a sort of hardcore misconfiguration in the zone files. Um, same consideration applies also to, to abandoned records, with the exception that uh, uh, on average abandoned records survive longer. Uh, what's the harm of uh, having this orphan record inside the, the zone file? Orphan records are basically working ADNS records that can be still in use. They can, they can be referred by other domain as NS records, uh, or they can also be used as hosting content. For example, they, if I define a glue record that is voo.something.com, I can use that for hosting a website, and this website could be also malicious. Um, and these webs the, the information for this website will be uh, provided by the... Um, the top level, uh, the, the, the top level domain zone. So uh, we uh, registry should remove this record, or at least they should forbid registration of the parent domain of this record because an attacker could potentially register the parent domain and eject all the traffic related to the orphan record. That means that if there are uh, other NS record uh, that point to uh, uh, other domain for which the NS record point to these orphan record, basically they will be ejected too. Uh, and we found basically that the domain that are potentially ejectable around 40k domain. Um, another problem is that these orphan records are DNS signed record uh, because basically your records are not signed, but since the parent zone, uh, since the, the domain is removed from the top level domain zone, uh, these records are promoted to be part of the top level domain zones, or they are not anymore glue, but they are record of the zone. So if the zone is DNSSEC signed, orphan will be DNSSEC signed too. Uh, so basically registers are signing and providing information, uh, authent uh, information about authenticity of junk records. Um, Looking to abandon it, from a first impression, it looks like that these, these records are not harmful at all. They are just polluting the zone files, but they are not really harmful. Uh, however, we discovered that there is a the relationship between orphan and abandoned. We discovered that around 28% of orphan records were previously abandoned records. And uh, that means that we can consider abandoned a sort of uh, uh, something that can tell that uh, a record will become a sort of orphan. Uh, instead, for 2% of orphan, we see that they become from orphan, become abandoned. That means that someone register actually that orphan, the domain related to that orphan, and that orphan become an abandoned because the, the delegation appears again in, in the zone file. Um, we try also to understand the, the origin of this orphan record, which, why, which is the, the reason why these orphan records come to exist. And this is the timekeeper, sorry. You have uh, another minute to go before question and answer. So we, we found also that uh, uh, around 54 uh, orphan records are not associated with information, meaning that they are potentially available for registration. Uh, for the one that we have with information, we see that uh, um, most of them are registered with GoDaddy and Namecheap. And we see also that orphan and abandoned records come to exist uh, uh, due to how APP protocol communication between registry and registrar occurs because basically in app we have these three object types that are domain content and host and the creation of uh, 
domain resources that are DNS record and the host resources are two independent operation and EPP doesn't enforce any check uh, on these kind of, uh, of records. So what do we uh, want to invite is to invite registry, registrar to take action and remove this record. In particular, in 2010, uh, after the, the work of Carla Foot, very signed clean up uh, the .com and .net zone, removing all the orphan records. But uh, still, after 10 years, some TLDs have been, have been affected by the orphan record misconfiguration. This problem was also addressed by a Nikon Security and Stability Committee issue in 2010. Uh, we advised all the top level domain to revise their EPP policy implementation and to clean up their zone. Uh, we reached also Affilias, which is responsible for technical, technical management of .info.org and many other top level domain affected by the orphans misconfiguration. And actually they are in process of taking action for removing orphan records from this zone. They wrote also a blog post about that. Um, Finally, we want to invite you to collaborate with us. We are really interesting to understand uh, from a registry perspective how many queries this orphan receives. Uh, we want to help you to remove these orphan records, identify and remove these orphan records from your zone, and you can help us to expand the coverage of our, of our DNS measurement for security purpose under the Open Intel project by providing you the CCTLDs zone file. So to conclude, uh, orphan records are revealed to be a long-term misconfiguration of DNS. After a decade from the original study, orphans are still there. We extend the scope, uh, introducing this problem of abandoned records, and we invite basically all registry to act to prevent the creation of these records. So thank you for your attention, and uh, I'm welcome to answer your questions. Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Rafaela, for a very interesting presentation. It's nice to see uh, research uh, work that resulted in uh, folks uh, making changes to their operational infrastructure as a result. So thank you. Well, let me see uh, what questions we have for you. Uh, so Dmitry Komanyuk asks, have you cross-checked uh, orphan glue records against other TLDs? I suspect a single registry may keep them precisely due to references from there. So it means basically if the orphan are referred by other domains in uh, in other TLDs, yes, we checked it and we found that uh, orphan are usually uh, used actually as name server by other domain uh, in other TLD. However, we have a limited coverage because we we can only check for the zone file to which we have access under the Open Intel project, so we we don't have the global coverage for for that information. Okay, great. Yeah. So, so yeah, well, my fo one follow up question to that is if other TLDs are referring to uh, orphan glue, uh, is that orphan glue actually returned in a, 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 in a referral response for that TLD? I guess is that something you've checked or uh, are, is no, it's not, it's measurement not only looking at the zone file contents? Yeah, we look, only look at the zone file, but actually that record is not, it's a perfectly working record. So if you query that record, you receive the, uh, the answer from the top level domain, for example, of .info uh, for that record. So it works perfectly in the DNS resolution. If another, uh, uh, if it's out of Bailiwick record for another uh, uh, top level domain, uh, domain, basically what will happen is that the, the resolution, the resolver will contact the .info right. Uh, name server will ask for that record and the team will provide information about that record, the, the orphan record. Okay, great. So let me see, we have another, uh, we have a uh, kind of a long comment from Joe Adley. Let me see if I'm gonna have time to read this. So not a question, but a comment. At PIR, we worked with Affilius to remove 13,000 orphan glue records from the org zone over the past couple of months. They were there due to an old software de defect in a code path that was not exercised very often. The 7,000 or so records that remain in org are not vulnerable to hijack. They have parents, but parents with publication suppression, mainly because of various kinds of domain suspension. Affiliates have made similar changes in other TLDs that they operate or provide backend services for. Thanks to Raffaele and others whose persistence in pointing this step out made us look harder. We are always happy to collaborate on this stuff. Okay, thank you very much for that comment, Joe. And I I think that's, let me just see if there are any other questions. Um, one more, let me see if I can squeeze it in. Um, this is from Gavin McCullough, who says, there are situations where one might, uh, for example, as a DNS provider, create glue records in advance of customers using a name server. I think these would match your definition of 
uh, orphan? Uh, is there a known way to prevent this other than registering domains? Uh, yeah, actually this one shows in uh, like the temporary orphan that we see in one that I show that basically lives for one day. Uh, but that should not be, uh, we should not see these kind of records in long term analysis. Because basically it's right, yeah, so to follow up on your answer, so I did notice you mentioned that there's like transitory things and then uh, things that are long term. So the transitory things, would you configure those, we, would you consider those misconfigurations or that's just like no, the normal actually, part uh, of domain lifecycle management? Uh, I will consider more a part of domain lifecycle management, that, that kind of stuff. Okay, great, thank you very much. Thanks uh, for that question. Uh, Gavin, and I think we're uh, done now. So we now have a 15 minute break in the schedule and we will reconvene at 1400 UTC sharp. So see you all back here then. So uh, next up we have uh, Wes Hardiker from USC ISI who will be talking to us about how centralized uh, DNS traffic is becoming. Uh, so Wes, can you go ahead? I sure can. And here are our slides. Hopefully you can see them, yes. I can see them and we can hear you fine. So yes, go okay. for it. Uh, yeah, so today I'm gonna to be talking about clouding of the internet and how centralized the DNS aspect of, of centralization is occurring. Uh, and the principal person of this work is actually attending the conference as well and this Giovanni Mario, but uh, it was put together by you know five people uh, looking at various sources of data um, you know, centralization has been in the news a lot. It's been a concern in uh, lots of different sec uh, sections of, of both the world and in industry. Um, in the in the EU, actually, that should be the New York Times. Uh, is is the there was an article about how Europe is shifting their tactics to limit tech's power because of centralization. And specifically, they were looking at Amazon, Facebook, Google, and Apple. Um, similarly, uh, there was you know an anti trust review of big tech companies that was recently you know, talked about in Congress as well in the United States. Um, and then in the IETF, actually, Yari Arco uh, has produced an internet draft talking about you know, centralization within the uh, internet infrastructure and how much that might be a concern in particular. And a lot of this has come about at, um, for various reasons, but some of the biggest ones are that people perceive it as a risk. Um, and multiple risks, really. And it creates a single point of fa failure. And this was actually seen in the Dyn DNS 2016 attack, which took out a large number of rather major websites, you know, within the United States as the infrastructure was, was taken over there. And uh, it's also a concern for privacy. A lot of people, you know, worry about all of their data going to a single provider, as we've seen more and more shift toward, you know, DNS over Doe and DNS over things like you know, Doe and Dot going to uh, single points of providers, people have a concern about that. Or in large major ISPs, Comcast, for example, is a, is a gigantic, gigantic ISP that um, has, you know, been, people have been concerned about all of the content going through a single internet provider, for example. And then there's also market consolidation. Um, you know, do we end up with companies that are too big to fail, for example, and, and things like that, where we really can't afford a loss of their infrastructure. So, uh, the uh, the Amazon Route 53 attack was um, you know similar in 2019, uh, leaving you know AWS you know hit, got hit by a large DDoS attack, and that's really more about the, um, the the single point of failure, and as well as the market consolidation. There there are not many cloud providers out there that actually provide the services that they do. Uh, there are certainly others um, like Microsoft, but the the number is low. And can we measure this though? And that is far easier said than done. And there's really many aspects of centralization. It's not just about the DNS, but what did we do? You know, of course, we're a DNS org, so we actually looked at the DNS side of things. But, you know, if you think about it, you could measure it in terms of users, you can measure it in terms of traffic and network infrastructure and computing infrastructure um, in the, you know, the economic market even. Um, but we did focus on the DNS, as I said. Um, we did not focus on user traffic specifically. We focused on the traffic from the resolver to the authoritatives. Uh, you guys are all the experts here, so you understand that you know users talk to a resolvers, and resolvers may send some of those queries off to authoritative servers. Interestingly, we we one of the things that we wanted to do is is actually look at things from three different perspectives. We wanted to look at things from two 
totally different countries and two totally different um, you know, sections in terms of the language that they speak and the geographical positioning in the world so that we actually got sort of a different viewpoint. So um, you know, in the Netherlands, the primary language is Dutch and the continent that they're in is, is in Europe. Whereas in New Zealand, uh, you know, the continent's Oceania, so it's a completely different section of the world, as well as the official languages are different as well. And then we also looked at um, the diddle data from Beirut um, that sort of represents all of the languages in seven continents, so the, the wider, uh, larger distribution. We looked at five companies uh, that are large cloud providers and one hypergiant, which is Facebook. Um, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and Cloudflare all have large DNS service uh, servers that um, that might, you know, query a lot so, to the. Wes, if I could interject, are you advancing your slides? Because I don't see uh, uh, the slide I see is centralization poses various risks. That's not possible. Uh, let me try and reshare. What do you see now? Uh, what we measure DNS queries from. Is that the right slide? OK. Uh, yeah, so there's all the other slides. Are you yep. seeing? Yeah, we can see you advance now. Oh, that's weird. OK. Well, I'll continue from here due to time. Uh, so DNS queries you know, come from a lot of different ASs from a lot of different companies. Um, the one that we included that's not necessarily a, a cloud provider, but is more of a content provider, as I said, is Facebook. Um, but they're rather large and generate a lot of traffic, so they're interesting to look at. Uh, the data sets we looked at, you know, there's 55 billion queries in total um, for one week a year and for three, three years. Uh, that's for both .nl and .nz. Uh, for bwservers.net, we looked at the diddle data from uh, 2018 through 2020 uh, at, at these uh, servers. What did we find? So a number of interesting things came out of these measurements. Um, if you look at traffic to beta.rootservers.net, you'll see that you know maybe up to 10% or so came from cloud providers, and it grew a little bit from 2018 to 2019 and 2020. Uh, if you look at it going to New Zealand, you know the, it's actually significantly more traffic. It actually kept, you know went up to uh, 25, 20 to 30% of their traffic going to New Zealand, and even bigger to the Netherlands. So all of them for all three years are over over 30%. So there's a, it's interesting to see the regional differences between uh, b.resource.net, you know, growing up through the New Zealand and the Netherlands, showing that there's actually a, quite a difference between the regionality. So roughly, you know, five, a third of all queries to the Netherlands and to New Zealand um, see, you know, one third of them come from cloud providers, which is, uh, which is a lot. Considering there's 50, there's, excuse me, 40,000 anonymous uh, systems that were actually recorded, you know, five clouds actually went there. Uh, for b.rootservers.net, you know, received significantly less with only 9% from the clouds. Uh, this is likely affected by the tons of, you know, Chromium-based garbage that uh, uh, we talked about. I talked about actually at a previous DNS org, as well as wrote a blog for AP NIC, and it was later followed a couple of weeks ago, a blog by uh, VeriSign as well. Um, and then oddly, Google sends more traffic to .nl than .nz. So you can see that there's actually a cloud shift uh, you know, between the individual um, TLDs, for example. So different clouds serve different uh, contents of traffic to those zones, it seems like. So what do clouds dream of when they're visiting the Netherlands? Um, so these are all the graphs for, for the Netherlands in terms of the types of queries, the types of R queries, uh, R codes that were seen. Uh, from 2018 to 2020. And so you can see that year to year, it actually shifts quite a bit, um, especially between 2018 and 2019. If we look at uh, New Zealand, uh, you can see that you know, there's actually a significant difference. There's a lot more uh, NS records on the, on the 2020 side, and we'll talk about that again in a minute. But if I slowly shift back and forth between them, you can see them, you know, jump around again, and it's interesting to see the the uh, different aspects of the world, you know, be hit by completely different types of queries. And again, if of course we go to B root, we end up with entirely different um, sets of queries as well. A lot more A records go to the B root, for example. So uh, looking at just the time, so this is actually all five uh, providers in 2018 for .nl on the left, the .nz in the middle, and uh, b.rootservers.net on the on the right hand side. Um, and if we compare that to 2019, you can see that there are shifts in what is actually being asked for from these providers. 
and then in uh, 2020. So it's interesting to see the, uh, the transitions across time as well as across regions. So when you look at all of this data, you know, mostly everybody's asking for A records, right? Mostly all of those, those bottom hatches are all A record requests and that's uh, the predominance of the, of the queries, of course. Um, if you look at just Google, then you end up noticing that if you compare um, the traffic from Google going to the Netherlands in 2018 versus 2020 on the right hand side, you'll see that there is, you know, a fairly big jump in uh, Google's the left hand bar. Uh, there's a gigantic jump in the NS queries and this actually came from them enabling QNAME minimization as was discussed earlier today and verified earlier today by Google as well. And we did confirm that they, you know, deployed QNAME minimization in, starting in December of 2018, as was seen um, in the discussion earlier today as well. Um, and if you actually graph Google during 2019 to the Netherlands, you end up seeing a slow transition from, uh, you know, looking at uh, the NS records that were, the NS record queries versus the A record queries sort of shifted places. And so it's, you know, very, very clear when you look at it on a, on a, uh, temporal line, you know, over six months that you can see a, a slow roll of progress. Um, there's a really good side to centralization that I think most people, you know, don't really talk about much, which is that uh, you end up when you deploy new security features or new, you know, um, privacy features or things like that, you end up affecting many users at once. Um, you know, DNSSEC validation and key name minimization have been discussed widely and when the large cloud providers or large ISPs adopt it, um, a lot of people end up getting that data, uh, getting that, that protection all at once. And that actually turns out to be a benefit, um, you know, in contrast to some of the cons that I talked about sort of in the beginning. Um, the, the junk queries that, that the cloud's uh, providers send are also interesting to look at. And so by junk, we mean um, what are the records that are sent to the authoritative servers that the authoritative servers can't answer to. Um, it's been well discussed at the root level, uh, especially with the Chromium bug that I mentioned. Uh, so it's not a bug, it's a feature um, that I talked about earlier, right? Uh, lots of queries are generated to the root servers for non-existent TLDs. Well, you know, even the CC TLDs and the TLDs in general, of course, get a bunch of queries for things that, you know, may not exist. In fact, you know, a lot of uh, people, when they're searching for, um, you know, new names to register, they'll do it by seeing if something exists just by typing into their URL bar and that actually generates a non-authoritative name that generates junk. Um, so if you look at the junk ratio from all of these to uh, the Netherlands, you can see that, you know, it also has varied over the years. There was a large spike in 2019 by Cloudflare. Uh, we don't have great ground truth on that. Amazon's sort of more consistent with the green hatching um, and different providers send different amounts of junk. If you look at uh, the the junk queries to dot uh, nz, you know, you can see that it differs significantly. Uh, they seem to get more and they get more from Amazon, whereas Cloudflare actually sent less in 2019. So uh, interesting transitory uh, times. Of course, uh, junk queries sent to B root. So this is only from the clouds, to remind you. So you remember that uh, because Chromium likely, you know, swamps the vast amount of um, uh, data, the, the junks from the clouds, uh, I'm sorry, Chromium is actually not in these graphs. The junk from the clouds, this is only comparing the, the cloud providers against their own data. So in 2019, Cloudflare sent a, you know, a 70, I forget the exact number, it's a little over 75% of their traffic to, uh, to b.rootservers.net was, was all junk that we couldn't answer for. Um, and it's strange, you don't expect many people to run things like web browsers or things like that within infrastructure. Um, and we, we didn't dive into deep into the, um, the details of why these particular jump queries existed. Uh, when, you, when you dive into it, you know, as I mentioned, that's sort of the definition of our jump queries. They're, they're non-authoritative domains that were received. Um, the distribution does vary very widely by, by where things are going to, uh, which is interesting to see. And that, uh, if you, uh, we, we talked earlier today that the, the reduction in um, that B root uh, was proportionally less from the junks. Uh, it, this is likely because of things like uh, insect aggressive caching, again, a protection that, you know, may benefit large quantities of users, or uh, in this case, some, sometimes the servers alone, uh, less junk actually gets to the, um, the, the root zone. It also might, uh, excuse me, never mind. 
So we also wanted to measure the cloud adult, uh, technology adoption, right? If you consider DNSSEC and you consider IPv4 versus IPv6 and you consider UDP versus v TCP, how, how do clouds actually differ in their resulting data for that? Um, DNSSEC provides, you know, authentication and integrity, as you all know, um, whether what clouds actually use it, right? So if you look at the adoption for who is actually um, measuring DNS key queries by uh, Microsoft and Cloudflare, uh, you can see that they differ, you know, actually quite a bit in terms of the, the DNS key queries per thing. So it's hard to see in this graph because it's the little tiny uh, slashed, uh, backslashed lines. Um, but the DNS key queries are actually quite low. Um, if you look at IPv4 versus IPv6 adoption, you'll see that roughly 50% of Google and Cloudflare are, um, makes heavy use of v4 and v6. And there's more IPv6 for Facebook from 2019 and onward. So you can actually look at sort of the, the deployment. Um, interestingly enough, there's very little IPv6 adoption from Microsoft and Amazon, as you see in the in, the, the Microsoft line, the one in the middle, uh, it's sort of a zero on the IPv6 line. And then Amazon actually grew, it went up from zero, um, growing a little bit over the, over the years um, to both .nl and .nz, um, but are still generally fairly low, whereas the other ones have numbers that uh, are more in line with um, e equality. You can actually see sort of a trend toward IPv6 adoption in a lot of these numbers if you look at them closely. In terms of UDP versus TCP, uh, you will note that uh, TCP is used, of course, for large queries, but Facebook in particular um, uses a lot more TCP than the other providers. If you look at you know, the, the left-hand UDP column and everything, you'll see that most of those numbers are actually quite large um, you know, as, a, as a fractional proportion, where Google, Amazon, uh, Facebook, and Cloudflare all send you know, the vast majority of their queries over over uh, UDP, but Microsoft um, actually sends almost no, no traffic over um, TCP and Google sends almost no traffic over TCP. Um, but Facebook actually sends a lot over TCP. And so when you break it down and you look at it, well, it actually turns out that one third of Facebook queries has EDNS uh, UDP zero sizes of less than 1024, uh, which means that they're gonna get truncated answers significantly more because of that uh, low uh, parameter in the in the EDNS zero you know, packet uh, option, um, so TCP is sort of required after that, and it ends up you know being shown in the data from uh, in the table. So it explains why they're they're actually generating more TCP queries. So sort of in conclusion, um, clouds aren't the same. <laughs> I think everybody knew that, uh, but when we actually look at it, how it happens in in the DNS, they do uh, account for a large quantity of traffic that heads to the clouds. It heads to the uh, authoritative servers. Five clouds actually generate one third of the CCTLD queries to um, to .nz and .nl, as I mentioned. And again, I keep calling them all clouds, but but Facebook is technically more of a, a hypergiant uh, would be the modern terminology for them. And then technical adoption varies, you know, quite significantly. We showed DNSSEC transport and routing all uh, vary significantly in terms of what is being seen regionally around the world. And reminder that you know centralization does have a pro when you roll out new security features like QNAME minimization or DNSSEC or you know transitioning to IPv6, you know those that benefits a lot of people all at once. Uh, the downside is um, you guys didn't see the the headlines in the beginning because of the slide failure, but uh, if it breaks, it can be it can affect more than um, it can affect many users at once. So uh, the paper is being presented at IMC 2020. Uh, that you can get links to it, of course, from uh, the slides. If you download this, the link in the PDF will uh, take you to the. Uh, it's a short paper. It's not a, a long paper. So it's a six-page paper. Any questions? Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Wes. Let me start relaying questions for you. Uh, I see one from uh, Joao Damas, and he asks. Uh, how much do you think Google queries are inflated by being used for log replays? We see heaps of those queries at various intervals coming to our servers to the extent that we had to write code to filter them out. <laughs> I don't know. One of the things that um, I, I think more research needs to be done is, is finding sources of ground truth. As, as everybody knows, that's hard to do in the DNS a lot because there's uh, so much junk. <laughs> we measured the junk, right? There's so much junk in the DNS, it's actually hard to uh, to get a whole lot of ground truth. You end up having to, to do a lot of manual searching through records. So we did not uh, 
uh, dive that deeply into um, the exact reason why Google might be sending, uh, you know, so much traffic, for example. Okay. Uh, next question is from Nicolas Antoniello, uh, who asks, have you seen any change in DNS traffic centralization due to recent uh, DOX implementations? Uh, uh, we have not tried to measure that, so uh, no, I would have to say. Right, so I think the TLDs that you're collecting data from, none of those actually have encrypted transport enabled, right? I don't believe that they, I don't think either one of them do. I think most TLDs um, don't. And, uh, you know, how much uh, resolver to authoritative traffic is actually getting, being encrypted right now. I haven't seen measurements of that yet from almost anybody. Um, but uh, my guess is that that is still significantly low. And uh, there's, you know, that's being worked on in the IETF and things like that and being discussed in a lot of places. Um, but, you know, certainly uh, it's to the, to most of the TLDs that I know of and to the root server system uh, that's not available yet. Mm. Yep, makes sense. Uh, next question is from Paul Hoffman. Uh, do the numbers you give for IPv4, IPv6 really indicate adoption? They seem more likely to be about routing being better for one than the other. Yeah, actually, um, one of the graphs that I wanted to put in, there's a really good graph in the paper that uh, Giovanni put together that actually shows um, why routing actually affects things regionally. So I do encourage you to go look at the paper because it actually shows that um, some of the numbers in this graph, when you break them down uh, more regionally, you'll actually end up seeing that uh, latency actually contributes to why the numbers in this graph are the way that they are. And so when, when IPv4 and IPv6 are actually you know, quite similar in terms of latency, you end up with you know, fairly similar uh, numbers from from both of them, whereas I think it was in the, I, I don't have the graph fully memorized in my head, but I think in, in the case of Microsoft, the, uh, the, the routing deployment was better for, for v4, and that's why most of the queries ended up going there. Uh, but go read the paper, don't quote me on that graph on, on the results. Yeah, that. yeah, that makes sense. Well, so just to follow up on, on my thought about that, I had a similar thought uh, that, the, that Paul mentioned in his questions about IPv6 transport preference by resolvers, right? I mean, there's a lot of factors that determine their name server selection algorithms, you know, routing and latency principally being some of the things. But uh, my question was, do, rouse, do, do any resolver implementations give any preference to IPv6, all other things being equal? Because applications uh, tend to, a lot of them tend to do things like happy eyeballs now, right? Where they give IPv6 a little head start if they're kind of in, in the ballpark. Uh, do you have any sense is there an easy way to measure uh, that? Uh, uh, the answer to that question is my first question. Or do you have any sense of the answer? No, I mean, it's hard. You have to start this. You have to look across multiple data sets and, and yeah. try and get a, a feel. And you can start looking in, in even routing tables and things like that. But you end up having to compare you know, multiple things at once. And unless you have a good source of all of that data at once, it becomes hard. You know, it, it becomes a multi factored you know, problem. And then you are also making the assumption that correlation and causation are the same thing, uh, which is you know, the well-known issue of, well, uh, just because we measured that latency is lower, does, it, does that actually, you know, under, does that actually, is that actually true? And the reality is you need to look at the code to figure out, you know, how much latency is actually being um, affecting DNS queries and how much happy eyeballs and things like that, you know, uh, are actually implemented in a way that, that makes sense. The happy eyeballs RFC is interesting to read. Uh, my understanding is very few people actually follow the happy eyeballs exact algorithm that says you're supposed to wait, uh, what is it, uh, five milliseconds or something like that, uh, I don't remember the number, um, before actually starting your IPv4 connection, you're supposed to give IPv6 sort of its preference, um, a slight preference. My understanding yeah. is no one does that. <laughs> yep, okay, so continuing with the questions, uh, Giovanni Mora makes a, a follow-up comment on this topic, he says, I think with Unbound, you can actually configure it to give an explicit preference to IPv6. Um, uh, so moving on, Joe Abley asks, uh, not all these clouds are the same. Some are big resolver operators. Yep. Facebook is a single application. Does it make sense to compare them directly along all the axes you identified, considering that their reasons for sending queries are different? Yeah, that's absolutely absolutely true, and and um, there's multiple hints of of that in all of the slides as well as in the paper. 
we're trying to provide uh, an analysis of who sends a, a bunch of traffic and, and the types of traffic that they're sending. We are not trying to say that you know Microsoft versus Amazon or one is better than than, than the other. Um, and you're hundred percent right that there are reasons each company's reasons for sending the queries the way that they do, you know, might be business related. It might not have anything to do with technology related. Okay, great. Uh, let's see, I think I've drained the queue of questions. We still have five minutes though, so I'm gonna hang around a little bit just to make sure, uh, you know, we catch people furiously typing away <laughs> their next set of questions. So come on, folks. <laughs> so in the meantime, let me uh, let me ask another question that just occurred to me. So you mentioned, you spent some time uh, talking about the junk queries and that you didn't really classify them. So, so my um, understanding from what you just said is junk queries are things that uh, uh, are eliciting NX domain, right? They're not like queries for unrelated things that shouldn't have come to you, right? They're just NX domains under your authority. Is that correct? Uh, so the way that, that we, uh, or a uh, way that, that I think about it is that when I'm an authoritative server and I'm sending a response, if I set the AA bit to zero, right, I am not authoritative for uh, that answer and I'm setting an NX query, then, then yes. Um, okay, got it. So then you mentioned um, that uh, you are speculating that a, a vast proportion of these are used to uh, Chrome's, you know, NX domain uh, hijacking detection mechanism, uh, but you didn't really classify them, classify the actual count, right? Is that is that correct? Because I was thinking that it might be a good study to measure if you can just identify the junk queries and uh, compare them to recent measurements that I think VeriSign have done, where they attributed, like, I think, some very high number, like 50% of them to, to chromium. It might be an interesting exercise to do that because you yeah, already have the data, maybe you can analyze it. So uh, a couple of things. One, um, do, do note that, that when I was talking earlier, I did say that these graphs in particular were measuring the junk uh, versus the, the clouds themselves. So we are not taking into account when you look at um, uh, the b.rootservers.net data, for example, um, we are not taking into account all of the Chromium data that comes from other organizations. We're only I looking see. at ASs from these particular giants. Yeah. So really the, the junk versus themselves, because otherwise in you know, b.rootservers.net, there's no way that Cloudflare is taking up 70% of all of our junk traffic, right? Mm -hmm. Most of that's coming from the rest of the internet. Yeah. Now, um, because some of it, you know, some of the Chromium junk probably is leaking through Cloudflare 2 or to all, from, uh, through all of the ones that provide a public DNS server. Um, they are leaking to us, you know, through them. They certainly account for some of it because, you know, there are certainly users of Chrome and Chromium that are uh, sending junk queries to 1.1.1.1 to Quad 1. Okay, great. Thank you, Wes. I can go back so, so if we have a couple of seconds, you can see all the other new pretty articles that I failed to show earlier because Giovanni put these nice slides together showing uh, uh, the, the higher level, you know, news articles that are talking about um, centralization and things like that. Sorry we missed that earlier. All right, cool. So I think uh, we're done. I don't see any other uh, questions. So thank you very much again for your presentation, Wes. Yeah. Uh, and we're a, really <laughs> we're a couple of minutes early, but I think we can move ahead to our uh, next presenter. And uh, next up, we have uh, Kyle Schomp from Akamai, who will talk about ECS, the EDNS client subnet behavior of resolvers. So Kyle, take it away. And I'll just confirm that we can hear you. Yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you, great. Go great. ahead. All right, thanks, Ramon. Uh, hi, everybody. So yeah, I'm Kyle Schomp from Akamai. And I'm going to talk about ECS behavior and recursive resolvers. And this is a work that was presented at IMC in 2019, actually. So it's about a year old at this point. It's a collaboration with some researchers from Case Western Reserve University, Rami Aldaki and Michael Rabinovich. All right. So, sorry, do you see the videos on the right side of the screen? I'm just surprised to see them myself. The uh, so what was 
repeat what you're saying. We can see your slides fine. I Never mind. Okay, you can see the slides? Okay, yeah, I, yeah. the slides were obstructed for me, so I just wasn't sure. Yeah, All the right. slide we're seeing is ECS, EDNS, client submit extension diagram. Perfect, perfect, okay. All right, uh, so real quick then, I think probably most people here are already familiar with ECS, but I'm just gonna give a, a quick kind of information level setting here. So ECS is an option that you can send. It's the EDNS client subnet option. And it, its purpose is really to let recursive resolvers send more information about the clients to authoritative name servers. So if you look at the graphic on the slide here, right, this is kind of the standard interpretation of the path for resolution. A client wants to look up some name, it asks its stub resolver, the stub resolver asks the recursive resolver, and then that recursive resolver asks the authoritative name servers for the answer. The problem here that sometimes occurs is that authoritative name servers want to know something about the client that is asking the question because some authoritative name servers, particularly those for uh, CDNs, try to tailor the response to who's asking it. And from the perspective of the authoritative name server on the slide, then it looks like the recursive resolver is asking this query. Uh, but from previous uh, research, we know that there are cases where recursive resolvers are not very representative of the clients behind them. So the purpose of ECS then is for these recursive resolvers to forward some information about the client, right? And they do this by in the ECS option in the DNS query, uh, adding a prefix of the client's IP address and then a source prefix link, which is really just how many bits are in that prefix, right? And then in the ECS option that authoritative name, name servers send back, they set a scope prefix link, which really just acts as an override on the source prefix link. If they're, Recursive resolver sends a slash 20 to the authoritative name server. The authoritative name server can say, cache this actually for the slash 16 because this answer is pertinent for all clients within the slash 16. The recursive resolver should then return that same answer to all clients that are covered by the ECS prefix. And for clients that are outside of that prefix, they should ask the authoritative name server again to obtain a different, potentially slightly altered, tailored response from the authoritative name server. So the goal of our study then was to explore the behavior of the recursive resolvers out there on the internet that support this option. And uh, ECS RFC, I believe at the time of our study had, uh, had, had been accepted for three years. It's now closer to four, I believe. Uh, but it was in use even longer before that. So we, we figured this was a good time to go back and look and revisit this topic. And some of the questions we asked were, what recursive resolvers are supporting ECS and how many are there? Uh, how are they probing for behavior uh, in the authoritative name servers? How are they probing for support rather in the authoritative name servers? Uh, because as part of the RFC, it's recommended that recursive resolvers not always send the option but only send it to authoritative name servers that, that support it and use it. Then we looked at the source prefix links that the recursive resolvers are sending in this option, and also their adherence to the uh, scope restriction in the response that they got back from authoritative name servers. Uh, while doing this uh, study, we also came across a variety of different ECS uh, pitfalls, deployment pitfalls, uh, that I'll talk about in the latter half of the talk that I think are interesting because they impact the effectiveness of this particular option. Now, the data sets we used are twofold. Uh, we use logs from Akamai's authoritative name servers. And this, of course, allows us to see which recursive resolvers by IP address are sending the ECS option to Akamai, critically to Akamai. And then we also performed internet-wide scans of open recursive resolvers so that we could perform various active measurements on those recursive resolvers to, to measure their behavior uh, along with their support. So when it comes to ECS support in recursive resolvers, um, we collected those, those numbers from both of our different data sets. Uh, from the Akamai logs, out of 3.7 million total recursive resolvers, again, by IP address, that queried Akamai, only 7.7 thousand actually sent at least one query with the ECS option. That's only about 0.2%. So deployment still appears to be low based upon this data set. And these 7.7 thousand uh, roughly break into two major groups that, that uh, represent the majority of them. First, there is major public DNS services. There's a few of these that tend to represent the majority of all recursive resolvers that support ECS. 
And then there were an additional 40% that were from Chinese ASs. We don't really know why there seems to be this significant skew towards China and support for ECS, but we also note that uh, this finding is confirmed by another study that came out of Microsoft in 2019 as well. So there seems to be a general skew in support towards China, and I can't explain it. In the internet scan data set, we scanned 2.7 open, uh, open recursive resolvers, or sort of open resolvers, and those tend to be forwarders. So they forwarded to, in total, just 1,500 different recursive resolvers that support the ECS option. Now you note that this is a uh, lower support than we saw in the ACMI logs. And there's probably two reasons for this. First is that via open scanning of the internet, uh, open resolver scanning of the internet, it's probably not possible to discover all of the recursive resolvers uh, that you might see from a major authoritative name server like ACMI's. Uh, and the second is that some recursive resolvers may be very selective about which authoritative name servers they send the ECS option to. So in our scans, we were using an experimental authoritative name server, uh, just running our own domain. And those recursive resolvers may not have allowed listed it like they have, for example, Akamas. So if support is low, let's take a look at the probing strategies then that the recursive resolvers that do support the option are using on authoritative name servers. Now, to examine this, we took advantage of a feature of Akamai's authoritative name servers, and that's that they only support the ECS option with an allow list of recursive resolvers. To everyone else, they appear to not support the ECS option. What this means is that all the unsolicited ECS queries we get from recursive resolvers that are not allow listed uh, should represent their probing traffic, right? They're sending this option, uh, waiting to see if the authoritative name server responds with it, and then they should back off and retry at some particular interval or something like that. We saw a variety of different behaviors here, some very obscure and obtuse ones. Uh, but I want to really call your attention to just the first row here. And that's the vast majority of them always sent the ECS option. They're not probing. They're just always sending the ECS option. So this portion, at least of the RFC, it appears that many recursive resolvers are simply just ignoring. Also. In addition to always sending the ECS option, we noted that some of these recursive resolvers send the ECS option for all query types, including, for example, NS records. Uh, and the RFC suggests not to do this, but again, they seem to just decide to do this regardless. Okay, so they're always sending the ECS option, the vast majority of them. Let's take a look at the source prefix links that we actually saw then. And you can see the results for two different data sets in this table. I'm going to break down a couple of the rows in this table, though, to look at a little more closely. First, this, this text here, jam to 32, might be a little confusing. Uh, what this means is that the source prefix link was 32 bits, but the actual prefix, if you look at it, looks like it's only 24 bits, and then the last octet is filled up with either zeros or ones. This is likely a misunderstanding of the RFC. It looks like the, the intention here was only to send a slash 24, but they did not quite understand how to do that in their implementation. And therefore they sent what looks, what actually appears to be to the implementation 32 bits. This can be quite misleading to the uh, authoritative name server, of course, because they, they got 32 bits instead of 24 and they interpret it differently. Uh, and there's quite a few recursive resolvers, as you can see, that, that are doing this. I don't actually know which implementation this is, uh, but it's, it's problematic. In addition to that, you can see cases that appear to be privacy violations as well. There are recursive resolvers that for IPv4 sent greater than 24 bits, even though the RFC recommends not to. Uh, for IPv6, there are some that sent greater than 48 bits as well, quite a few in fact, uh, in the scan. And those uh, are, all, again, probably committing some sort of privacy violation. But it's not clear of yet to me, actually, what, what the impact of this leakage of privacy is. I think there's more research that needs to be done to better understand the impact. So moving on then to the scope restriction on caching. In the internet-wide scan, we were able to study 278 different 
ECS enabled recursive resolvers and look at their caching behavior. For this, we excluded major public DNS services because um, via other methods, it was easily determined that they honor the scope restriction. So we really wanted to look at the long tail of recursive resolvers here. Now, to test this behavior, we used a, a variety of tricks, I would call them. The details are in the paper, but the general idea is that uh, when you're scanning open resolvers on the internet, as I mentioned before, the majority of them are forwarders to a recursive resolver. So we found pairs of forwarders that forward to the same recursive resolver. And then we tried to fetch a name uh, from, the first, from the first open uh, forwarder and then later fetch the same name from the second forwarder and see whether or not we got an answer from cache or not. Depending upon the scope that our authoritative name server set, we of course should or should not have been able to fetch that record from cache. And we were able to use this behavior then to determine whether or not the recursive resolver was honoring the scope restriction. Again, here we found a lot of different behaviors, but I really want to call, you, call your attention to just the final line here again. So 102 of these resolvers simply don't obey the scoping cache restrictions at all. And this really means that they're just lying to the authoritative name servers, right? They send the ECS option in the query uh, claiming that they support ECS and saying it, that they are looking for a response for this particular uh, client prefix. The authoritative name servers tailor a response to it uh, and send it back. And then the recursive resolver returns that answer to all clients, regardless of which prefix they're in. And this has implication, implications to uh, authoritative name servers and their, their behavior, particularly for CDNs, right, who are attempting to do load balancing or something like that. Uh, because the load they think they're delivering to a certain HTTP edge server is not actually what's ending up there. So let's turn now, I think I'm about halfway through, and let's, uh, let's switch over to talking about our ECS deployment pitfalls that we observed along the way of doing this study. The first one is unroutable ECS prefixes. Um, we found something that sort of surprised us while we were doing the internet wide scan. And that was that 33 of the recursive resolvers we found sent the loopback address as the ECS prefix. And this was not at all what we expected to see. So we wondered, uh, could this confuse authoritative name servers? And to find out, we just ran a simple little measurement. From a test machine, we sent a query with unroutable ECS to uh, specific authoritative name servers and then obtained the IP address of some HTTP edge server that the authoritative name server returned to us. And then we measured the RTT to that HTTP server. So for example, we did this with YouTube.com and their authorities uh, from a test machine in Cleveland, Ohio. And the table here then shows five different queries that we sent to these authoritative name servers and, and the results of those queries. Uh, in the first two, we sent either no ECS prefix or an ECS prefix that simply matched the slash 24 of the test machine's IP address. And in both cases, we got routed to Chicago uh, for the subsequent HTTP session, which has a, a reasonable RTT from Cleveland, Ohio. However, in the bottom three cases, we sent various unroutable ECS prefixes and we got routed all over the world to these HTTP web servers, right? Switzerland, California, South Africa. So unroutable ECS prefix is actually worse than not sending ECS at all for some authoritative name servers. Now the RFC does have language that says that authoritative name servers and recursive resolvers should at least treat unroutable addresses as equivalent to the recursive resolver's own identity. But there's nothing specific about what recursive resolvers should send. So we think there's probably an opportunity here to add some language that recursive resolvers should be sending routable prefixes in the ECS option, or simply not sending the option at all, since uh, these results seem to suggest that sending an option with an unroutable prefix is, is actively harmful. The next uh, deployment pitfall is the impact of source prefix lengths. Uh, so recursive resolvers, of course, have a lot of leeway in deciding what length, what source prefix length they're going to set in the query that they send to authoritative name servers. And to find the impact of this choice, uh, we used two different CDNs and 800 random write atlas probes. Uh, from a test machine, we sent queries to the two CDNs 
with an ECS option, the prefix of uh, in came from these right atlas probes for various different uh, uh, links of that prefix, right? And then from the probes, we measured the TCP handshake uh, time uh, from the probe to each one of the IP addresses that these two CDNs returned. So these two CDFs uh, show our results here for CDN1 and CDN2, which we've obfuscated here. Uh, the, of course, the x-axis is time to connect, right? So it's preferable to be further to the left than to the right. Uh, and you can see that in the case of CDN1, if you send less than 24 bits in ECS prefix, uh, performance is degraded, right? Because it shifts to the right. All the lines except for the 24 uh, seem to take longer to connect. However, for CDN2, if you send less than 21 bits, then performance degrades. So you can send a full three bits less to CDN2 and it doesn't negatively impact performance. So what prefix length should recursive resolvers use, right? Well, the RFC is clear that greater than 24 bits is a, uh, is a violation of user privacy, right? You're reducing the anonymity that set that the, that the user is able to hide with them. But the results here seem to suggest that sending less than 24 bits is negative for it has negative impacts for some CDNs, at least some, right? So resolvers really have a choice here. They can either try to keep track of the source prefix length they should send per authoritative name server, or they could just send 24 bits for everyone. And that seems more likely to be the decision that wins out because it's a far simpler um, choice to implement. All right, uh, one more pitfall then, I think I still have time, uh, is the impact of hidden resolvers. So again, in our internet scan, we found some things that was, again, a bit surprising to us. Uh, this graphic shows the sort of the, the standard layout of the internet scan, right? From our scanner, we sent a query to an open forwarder that forwards that query to a recursive resolver, and then the recursive resolver sent a query onto our experimental authoritative name server. However, in a small fraction of these measurements, the ECS prefix that arrived at our authoritative name server didn't match the forwarder's IP address, the recursive resolver's IP address, or even the scanner's IP address. And that suggests that there's something else here, something in the middle here, that the recursive resolver is picking up the IP address and putting into the ECS prefix. Regardless of what is exactly that thing in the middle, right? Uh, it's important to note here that the authoritative name server is going to use the ECS prefix rather than the recursive resolver's IP address or any of the other IP addresses it doesn't even know for server selection, right? To pick out an HTTP server for the client to connect to. So the, the natural question that comes out of that then is, is the recursive resolver or the hidden resolver prefix closer to the forwarder, right? Because that determines whether or not ECS is beneficial or harmful in this case. We broke down the scenarios into, into three groups. Uh, cases where the hidden resolver is further away from the uh, forwarder than the recursive resolver, which is 7.8% of our measurements, uh, where they're roughly the same distance, 19.5%, and then when the hidden resolver is closer than the recursive resolver, which is the majority, 72.7%. But these first two cases are cases where ECS is actively har harmful, the top row, right? Because you're getting mapped further away from the forwarder by using ECS or just not beneficial, right? Because you might as well use the recursive resolver's IP address if the ECS data is just as close to the forwarder. And that counts for 30% of our measurements. This is of course in terms of measurements rather than in terms of a portion of the population. So I can't say how common this is on the internet, but it does clearly at least make the case that it is very important when deploying ECS to make sure that it is deployed and supported throughout the entire resolution path from forwarder all the way to recursive resolver. Otherwise, ECS can be added some point later in the path and be potentially harmful to end user experience. So quickly to summarize the, the key takeaways, I think. Uh, first, ECS deployment remains um, not very widespread, which is probably not very surprising. Uh, the deployment that does exist is concentrated with a few public DNS providers and a unexplained skew towards China. Uh, 
probing for ECS support by authority by recursive resolvers of authoritative answers is, is virtually unused, except for uh, a few major public DNS services. Uh, resolvers are either always sending the ECS option in all their queries or not sending it at all. There's some evidence of privacy erosion by a too long of ECS prefixes, but there, there's more study really needed there to understand the significance of this. And many recursive resolvers uh, are uh, disregarding the scope caching restrictions. And this is disruptive to authoritative name servers in both their uh, load balancing and the, how they do server selection. It's also a violation of the RFC, clearly. Finally, there are many different pitfalls in deploying ECS that can make it either useless or harmful to users. And these include uh, sending unroutable ECS prefixes to authoritative name servers, uh, sending too short of an ECS prefix, which can be harmful to some CDNs, and uh, the observation of hidden resolvers, cases where the ECS is a, a poor representation of the ultimate client because it is not supported along the entire resolution chain. That is my talk. I can take questions. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Kyle. Let me start relaying some questions for you. And we have from one from Moritz Muller, uh, slightly provocative, shall we say. He says, considering that ECS seems to have many issues and is not very widespread, do you still think it still makes sense for CDNs to rely on ECS to direct traffic? I think it is important to CDNs that it still be used. And there are a few, uh, I mean, I don't wanna to be too negative on it, right? There, there are people that are certainly implementing it correctly. So it can be effective in many cases. There are just many cases where it is also not effective. Uh, and I think it's very important that it exists for CDNs. So part of what I would hope to see come out of studies like this is an effort to try and clean it up a bit and get rid of cases where it is either not useful or harmful to uh, performance. Okay, uh, next question is from Brian Dixon, who asks, did you validate ECS on the public providers? Do they all do what you determine is good for end user performance? For authoritative providers, are there simple rules for looking at what is sent in ECS versus the IP address of the resolver? That is, only use ECS if slash 24 or one of the well-known resolvers. Uh, that's a good question. So uh, first part, um, we did not validate behavior of all open uh, public DNS services. We looked at a few of them and found that in general, their behavior looks correct for the RFC. Um, to, the, to the second point as to are there some general rules of thumb that authoritative name servers can use, uh, a few clear examples are ignore unroutable ECS prefixes, right? Uh, that's, that's a change that I believe Google has already made at this point for their authoritative name servers and other authoritative name servers should look to do as well. Uh, I don't know of any particular way that you can, from other ECS prefixes, know whether or not it is good or bad, right? Because ultimately you, you don't have the information to compare it against. Uh, so a recursive resolver could potentially send you cases where the ECS is reliable and you should be using it because it will allow you to return a better answer. And also at the same time, other cases where it is not reliable and you won't be able to distinguish because it is coming from the same source. Okay. Next question is from uh, Bill Bellinger who asks, did you notice any meaningful distinction between IPv4 versus IPv6 usage of ECS or even improper usage of ECS? That is a good question. And so while um, if I go back, I believe, so we broke down the, the actual prefix that we see in the option, right? But I did not look at this in terms of the, the um, IP protocol used in the connection from recursive resolver, whether or not this recursive resolver was over V4 or V6. Um, so I don't know about that. And between these, I, I'm not sure I can make any meaningful distinction between these numbers to say that the one sending V6 
ECS prefixes are behaving more or less good than the ones that send the V4. So I really can't answer that, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, next question is from Paul Ebersman. The current RFC was done with the assumption that a new version of ECS that would learn from operational problems would be done. Is Akamai willing to work on such a new improved ECS? I can't commit to it personally, but um, we can certainly talk about it. Maybe that's a question for offline. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Nicholas Antoniello, uh, as for the non-routable prefix and sent in ECS, do servers have different behavior when they get a non-routable compared with getting a, a non-ECS content queries? Oh, I see what you mean. Um, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, so certainly the behavior, at least in our, in our one experiment with youtube.com, right, seems to suggest that if you send no ECS option, of course it uses the recursive resolver's IP address, right? The, the source IP address. Uh, it looks like, again, I, I'm not from Google, so I can't really tell the internal workings here, but it looks like if you send ECS, it always prefers that over the recursive, the source IP address, the recursive resolver IP address. Um, there could be behaviors there that I'm not aware of though. Okay, great. Uh, so let's see, we still have uh, five more minutes. So let me wait to see if other questions are coming in. And while I'm waiting, I'm gonna slip in <laughs> One of my own. Uh, so the loopback. So on the not, not just to follow up on the non-routable prefix topic. The uh, the pre the uh, observation of loopback ECS prefixes was very bizarre. But I'm wondering, is that because of things like um, systems running uh, a full resolver or a proxy on their loopback addresses, and they're just the code is just automatically injecting 127.00/24 slash and sending it upstream? Could that be a possibility? So, yeah, we did speak to at least uh, one implementer, <clears throat> excuse me, of a recursive resolver who uh, provided an explanation for why we might see the loop back from them. And the, the answer was effectively that when the clients come in, they might be coming in on, um, on themselves, private local IP space, right? Say 10 dot or something like that. In which case, the recursive resolver doesn't have any information to send on. So it was sending on the, the loopback as a signal essentially that there was no meaningful ECS information to send. Uh, I, I can see pros and cons to that argument. I, I think it would be better to not send the ECS option at all in that case, mm -hmm. rather than send a, an effectively non ECS option as a, in the packet, right? Yep. Okay, that makes sense. And then, so the other question I was wondering is, so you express some dismay about the lack of uh, probing uh, behavior by <laughs> most implementations. And I'm wondering, I was just thinking when you said that, um, how uncommon it is and they're just unilaterally sending it. Do you think this is because, uh, you know, that goal is in conflict with the uh, uh, goal of efforts like uh, DNS flag day where resolver implementations are trying to reduce complex server depend dependent behavior in their resolver code? I'm just speculating here. I'm just asking whether that has any bearing. I, I'm not sure. Uh, the uh, I, I I agree with the notion that it is complicated, right? Uh, like implementing this kind of probing behavior is yet another complexity to add to recursive resolvers. Um, the concerns, of course, uh, maybe I didn't bring this up on the slide, but the concern, of course, and the reason why probing is recommended, is that. ECS, even if you're sending a slash 24, is a reduction in privacy than over not sending ECS at all, right? So if, a, if an authoritative name server simply does not use the option, it would be better not to send it to them because you simply don't need to leak that information about who asked the query in the first place. Uh, now, I, I think there, there's, there's a reason to kind of weigh these two. I mean, I, I think there are legitimate arguments to say, you know, complexity versus the privacy leakage here. Uh, I don't have a particular strong opinion about where we end up uh, as a result of that conversation, but we, we should probably have it before the next version of this RFC gets published. Yeah, okay, got it. And we have time for just one more question. And this is from Terry Bernstein 
who asks, do you have any idea as to usage volumes of the resolvers that do not obey scope caching restrictions? Can you characterize the organizations running these resolvers? Uh, let's see. Uh, so the answer is probably not. I don't think I have the data for that. The, the only characterization data I believe I have is that they do tend to be, uh, as I mentioned, skewed towards China. So the, the non-major public DNS services that are supporting the ECS option tend to be skewed towards China. And beyond that, I don't really have much data on their query volumes or the organizations that are actually operating them. Okay. All right, great. Thank you uh, very much, Kyle, for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, we now have a longer break in the schedule, but I'm going to hand things over to Keith before that as he has some announcements. So Keith. Okay, thank you, uh, Shimon and Anand, for this morning's session. Well, I say this morning, today's first session. Um, we'll be breaking for an hour. Uh, one of the things that I should do is thank the sponsors and um, patrons for um, this workshop and our workshops this year. I'm pleased to announce that we have a late breaking sponsor, NS1. I've uh, generously uh, agreed to uh, step up and sponsor this particular event. Also, VeriSign is our promoter patron for um, all the workshops this year. So, um, during the hours break, we're doing two things for. Um, interaction. Um, in a side Zoom room, Jerry Lundstrom will be doing a development as be anything. Um, so you, they, that will start at uh, 10 past 15, 10 UTC in 10 minutes. Um, and in Mattermost, um, ask about or chat room. Um, so Graves, our membership coordinator, will be um, available to ask any questions from existing or potential ORC members. Um, You'll see details of both of these rooms in the uh, rolling slides that are going past. Also, NS1 are giving us a chance to win a few prizes. So there will be details in the rolling slides in the Zoom side chat. Um, and um, that's it for now. Uh, we'll be resuming in almost exactly one hour at noon, sorry, at 1500 UTC. Hello, everybody. Welcome back from the break. My name is Ulrich, and I'm part of the DNS Award Program Committee. Uh, yeah, I hope you all had a good break uh, here in Stockholm. It was actually sun when we started, and it's now starting to rain. So absolutely time for some uh, more DNS. And uh, with that, I think we start right into it. And next up is Peter Spasek from CSEPNIC, and he's talking about DNS shotgun, realistic DNS resolver benchmarking. Please, Pedro, take it away. Thank you very much. Let me share my slides. I can see uh, your slides and I can hear you. That's excellent. So once again, welcome everyone to talk from very rainy Brno. So in this talk, we will briefly look at the RESPERF, which is venerable. And then we will have a look at a new tool called DNS Shotgun. And finally, we will dive into measurement results and try to draw some conclusions from them. So RESPERF is well known, uh, but the most important thing here is that it basically reads a text list with the queries which contain, and the list contains just name and type. And then the RESPERF is replaying the queries as quickly as possible until the resolver breaks. That's it. The problem is that the input text doesn't have any information at all about timing. So the cache hit rate is just unrealistic. It just doesn't make sense. And for encrypted protocols, it is also important to know that the text list doesn't contain any relationship between queries. So we just don't know which queries should go over which connection and that's it. We could go on, but to sum it up, RESPERF is just focusing on QPS and nothing else. So it's not really fit for a purpose of benchmarking encrypted protocols. So to overcome this limitation, uh, we at CZNIC Labs uh, started a project called DNS Shotgun. And the aim is to provide tool set for really realistic DNS resolver benchmarking. The tool already works. 
it has some very basic user interface and we hope that it will have more versatile user interface later this year. Uh, the first bullet is linked to the source code. It's open source GPLv3 as usual. And also the second bullet leads to automation scripts we were using for this presentation. So you can have a look, you can take inspiration. At this point, I think it's very good time to th thank uh, first DNS Org and especially Jerry from DNS Org for a library called DNS JIT, which we use to as a building block for DNS shotgun. And also uh, we would like to thank Comcast Innovation Fund because they funded the work uh, which allowed us to support encrypted protocols for DNS. Thank you. So finally, I was talking about DNS shotgun, why it is so different. Uh, the main difference when compared with RESPERF is that uh, RESPERF is measuring QPS and shotgun on the other hand is measuring the number of clients the resolver can handle. And obviously these two don't translate easily to each other because different clients have different behavior, does different QPS and so on. In principle, DNS shotgun reads PCAPs, preferably with real traffic as captured between the client and the resolver, and then simulates clients based on the behavior observed in the PCAP. When uh, shotgun replace queries, it is keeping the streams as, it, as they were in the original PCAP. So, if we say that uh, one client has one source IP address in our PCAP, the shotgun will use, for example, one TLS connection from uh, four queries from this one specific client, for example. Uh, also, the shotgun attempts to keep the timing plus min minus one second, so that should provide realistic hit rate. And of course, we need to configure the transport, right? So it allows us to fine tune parameters about a TCP connection idle timer and so on and so on. I think that was four minutes of theory and that's always too much. It, to, uh, it's boring. So let's have a look at some experiments. Uh, we have taken PCAPs from university and as far as we can tell in the PCAPs, there were no running attacks. So the traffic looked just normal. And then we always started experiment with clean state. So the resolver had empty cache and clients on the other, other side had uh, no TCP connections, no, nothing cached and so on. Then we used DNS shotgun to measure first two minutes after the client uh, started, after the client started sending queries to the resolver and we were monitoring whether the resolver is keeping up. That's it. Uh, then we find out that, okay, the, this resolver can handle this load. So we increased the number of simulated clients and went on and on until the resolver broke after the load. That's it. Uh, the very last bullet on this slide has some hardware parameters, but let me emphasize that this is not really important because different data set, different configuration and so on will lead to different absolute values from the measurement. So don't, you know, take the absolute values that, don't, don't get in love with them because what's more important is the relative comparison between different transports. The absolute values are just means, not the, the target. Okay, so of course I have to mention that for any benchmarking to succeed, uh, it is necessary to configure the software appropriately. So for the, each resolver, it's a little bit different. Uh, what's common is obviously a number of file descriptors, uh, file descriptor limit in the operating system. And then the hard part. The hard part is the networking stack in general. And unfortunately, the tuning is different for every network driver in Linux kernel. So. I will basically point you to the Linux kernel documentation. Look at the documentation for that particular driver and follow that. As an inspiration, uh, we are providing you also with 
our measurement scripts, which also do the tuning for you. So the very last bullet on this slide contains link to our tuning scripts. Finally, it was way too much talk. Now, finally, some numbers and charts. So in this chart, every single colored line uh, represents one measurement. And each measurement was done with different number of simulated clients. So for example, the brown line uh, down there is simulation of 600,000 clients. And the orange and the leftmost top corner is 300,000 clients. We can see that at the very beginning of the test in time zero, we just started the resolver with empty cache. And because the cache is empty, the resolver has a lot of work and obviously is not able to keep up with all the queries and answer them in time. So some queries time out, which leads to response rate uh, lower than 100%, and that's it. Over time, as the resolver gradually builds its cache, it has less work to do, and that implies that it is able to keep up with more incoming traffic and answer more. We can see that on the blue line, which is almost hidden in the background, with 200,000 clients, with 100% uh, traffic going over UDP, the resolver was able to answer in first three seconds, one, uh, um, again, sorry, after first three seconds, uh, the resolver was able to answer 100% of queries, easy as that. With 400,000 clients, which is the green line, the situation is more complicated because the resolver is under heavy load. So it needs more information in cache until it reaches a state where it uh, answers basically everything. So it takes approximately 20 seconds. And after 20 seconds, the resolver finally is answering all the queries. On the red line, we can see that uh, that's the situation where the resolver is already over overloaded. And even after 20 seconds or even after 60 seconds, it is not able to keep up and some queries are still not answered in time. So that's a very basic measurement. Again, let me repeat that the absolute numbers like 200,000 clients, 400 and so on are basically nonsense. It's you cannot generalize them and apply anywhere else. It's just from this specific measurement. Please, again, do not generalize. We will just take this number and compare that with different transports. That's it. So finally, TCP. Uh, first of all, we found out that if we want to simulate a lot of clients, we need a lot of source ports, but obviously, with one source IP address, we have only something like 60,000 source ports and we quickly run out of them. So a workaround is to add more source port, source, uh, sorry, source IP addresses to the client machine. And then we have more source ports and can open more TCP connections to the target. Then next problem is obviously that the resolver has its configuration knobs limiting the number of TCP connections. So then we have to increase that for that specific resolver. And finally, we are getting to question of idle timer because the client can either close the connection immediately as soon as the client gets its answers or the client might keep the connection open for longer period of time just in case something needs to be resolved. So. We've done the measurement again. Now with 100% traffic going over TCP without any encryption, just TCP and without idle timer. So the client is closing the connection as soon as it gets its answers, that's it. Here we can see that 20 seconds after start, uh, the resolver is able to service approximately 180,000 clients and that's about it. Of course, the question is what happens if we increase the idle timer from zero? So 
we increase the idle timer to 10 seconds. So the client keeps the connection idle for 10 seconds and then closes it. Now we can see that 20 seconds after start, the resolver is able to service approximately uh, 20, uh, 250,000 clients. And again, that's about it. So if we take these absolute values and put them in a table, we can compare the performance over plain UDP and TCP without idle connections and uh, TCP with idle limit 10 seconds. And now we can easily see that the TCP without idle timer basically degrade, um, leads to performance degradation approximately 2.2 times when compared with plain UDP. If we compute that, for a TCP with idle limit uh, 10 seconds, we get to something like 1.6 times worse performance when compared with plain UDP. Okay, that was TCP. That's the basic for TLS, right? So let's have a look at TLS. That's obviously way more complicated to benchmark because it has tons of parameters. First question is, what TLS version do we want to benchmark even? So we started with version 1.3. And then the next question is, what certificate signing algorithm do we use? We didn't know. So we benchmarked four of them. And then the question is, what is the behavior on the client side? Whether clients do TLS session resumption or whether they keep the TCP on connection open for a longer time, so they don't even need to do the assumption or what they do. So we were measuring with uh, idle limit 10 seconds and clients which did TLS session assumption. And it turns out that the TLS performance with RSA certificates, it's just terrible. So just don't do that. But luckily, the modern certificate signing algorithms like P256 or ED25519 or this like elliptic curve modern stuff, it's quite efficient. And in our measurements uh, against not resolver, the performance degradation, again, when compared to plain UDP, was approximately 2.9 times. Then we dig deeper into behavior of individual clients. And uh, it turns out that if the TCP uh, idle limit is reasonably long, let's say 10 seconds in our case, uh, tons of clients will open the connection in, in the very beginning of the test. And then most of the connections is stable, more or less. And just small subset of clients is opening and closing connection during the test, which really helps because it um, it doesn't force the resolver to do a lot of TLS handshakes. And it turns out that in case of uh, elective curves, the um, TLS session resumption doesn't save a lot of on the CPU side. It saves round trips, but not CPU. So what happens? if we configure the client to always close the connection as soon as it gets its answers. And then it's really bad. The TLS performance, even with the best performing certificate signing algorithm, is approximately 10 times worse when compared with plain UDP. So just don't do that. And finally, because we are done with TLS, we have arrived to holy grail of DNS protocol engineering, a TCP plus TLS plus HTTP. Yay. Uh, again, we have a problem that we have tons of parameters and we have to decide what to measure. So we have to select HTTP version. The version two hopefully uh, is what people use with EOH. We uh, went with that. Then the question of HTTP method, whether get or post, we went with a guest, a get, and it turns out that the difference is not really big. And then the problem is that basically everything depends on client. 
because in HTTP, the client has tons of options, what to do, what to send, what not to send, whether the client will do compression when sending uh, the HTTP headers or not, what headers the client will send, and so on and so on. So uh, it's really immerse field to explore. So in this case, in our case, we were benchmarking situation where the client is well behaved, doesn't send any extra headers nobody asked for, doesn't do anything crazy with HTTP compression, nothing, just well behaved DOH client. And in that case, our measurement, again, done using the same method, just gradually increasing the load until the result breaks. Uh, this method gave us a number that approximately, uh, the resolver is handled to approximately 3.3 times less clients than over plain UDP. So the performance degradation, if we use very performant ELS certificate signing algorithm and keep the TCP connection open for 10 seconds is approximately 3.3 times. So that's the DOH. And now, of course, the question is, OK, now we have seen numbers for latest, greatest development version of not resolver. What about others? With BIND, there is not really much to measure because there is no DOT or DOH. But we have PowerDNS and DNS dist as its external proxy, which does all the encryption. Unfortunately, for some reason, we were not able to get reasonable performance out of this combination. So we just gave up. But luckily, Unbound has DOT for quite some time. And a couple of weeks ago, Unbound also got DOH support. It's not released yet, but we are testing the latest code in, in master. So again, we were doing measurement using the very same technique. So again, increasing the number of simulated clients until the resolver breaks. And this gave us absolute values for each resolver. You can see that the numbers widely vary, but the absolute values are not really interesting. Now we can look uh, at the line with or row with UDP performance as a baseline. And now we can normalize the performance of other protocols for given implementation to this baseline on UDP. If we do that, we uh, get a table with uh, relative protocol performance. Or, or in other words, we can see if, all my, if I'm using a not a resolver and all my clients switch to DOT, uh, I will need 2.9 times more power or performance on the resolver side to handle the load. That's more or less meaning of the table. And to our surprise, we have found out that uh, performance overhead uh, for different transport protocols is very much similar across different implementations. Even though the baseline UDP performance is wildly different for different implementations, the overhead of TCP, TLS, and HTTP as implemented today is more or less the same. There are some variations, but we can say in general that for TCP, without any idle connections at all, the performance hit is something about two times. If the TCP connection is kept open for 10 seconds, it goes down, but again, for all the implementations. For TLS, it's a little bit harder to do, draw general conclusions because we have only two implementations to compare. But again, it seems that the performance overhead of encryption or TLS, I should say, and HTTP2 is more or less the same. So our, our time is up. So time to conclude. Uh, the most obvious takeaway is that just don't use RSA, avoid it if possible, use modern certificate signing algorithms based on elliptic curves. Then the surprise I just described that it seems that if you go to full TLS with reasonably behaved clients, 
it will cost you approximately three times what you have now. And that's basically it for the generic conclusions. The problem is that all the measurements very much depend on the client behavior because the client is the king. It depends whether the client keeps the connection open or not and so on. So the only really useful advice I have is do not generalize, do not trust my numbers, take the source code, it is available, take your pickups with your traffic, your client behavior and measure it yourself. If you need uh, any help or have any questions, please ask either now or send them to the email address as you can see in slides. Thank you for your time and I think that we should be able to handle your questions. Yes, thank you, Petter. Very interesting talk, and uh, we actually have some questions here. So let's see. Um, Joe Abley asks, uh, referring to your first slide with the graph, where is the resolver being tested getting its responses? Are they being retrieved from the live internet, or do you have some captive way of supplying responses to the resolver under test? That's a very good question. We do it on live internet, so whatever a uh, resolver has to do, it has to do on the internet. Obviously, it has an inherent reproducibility problem, so we just test it five times in our own. Uh, and if it comes same all the time, we think it's fine. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We, uh, we have another question from Ralph Weber. And he asked, wouldn't an actual measurement take some amount of new connections into account? If I understood correctly, your measurements only was one query or all clients keep connections open. Oh, sorry. I didn't explain that properly. Uh, we are replaying the behavior in the PCAP. So let's say that source IP address number one in the PCAP is one client and IP address number two is second client and so on and so on. So if we set the idle timer to 10 seconds, we look into the PCAP and look and start the replay. If the client number one sends the query in, I don't know, time five seconds, the client will open the connection at end the moment. And then if there are no other queries in for that particular client, the client will close the connection after the idle timer expires. So in time 15, the client number one will, will close the connection. And eventually, if the same client needs to do another query like half a minute later, it will open another connection and keep that connection open for next 10 seconds, or I mean the idle timer. So the length of the TCP connection is you know, made in a way which mimics what the real client would do. I think that answers Ralph's question. And so. we go on here. Um, next question comes from, uh, uh, oh, Ralph says, thanks for the explanation and the talk in general. Uh, did you measure how often we connect appear? Yeah, we have that in the data, but yeah, we can talk afterwards. I cannot fit everything in 20 minutes, sorry. Good. <laughs> yes, so um, you two get in contact. I think Ralph knows how to reach you. Sure. And so we have uh, Nikolai Leiman, and he asked, do you have more details on the problems with measurements on power DNS, DNS dist? Well, we do, but we told power DNS guys and they are looking into it. So yeah. maybe we are just doing something stupid because we are not power DNS experts and don't know how to configure DNS dist, but yeah. We don't know how to fix that yet, so we'll see. So will we see a follow-up in the future? <laughs> well, depends on what they find out. If it's just typo yeah. in configuration file, maybe I will hesitate to present. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> we um, keep you to it. And, um, <laughs> so we have another question. Puneet Sod asked, did you track CPU utilization during the tests? Implementations can have scaling limits when run on machines with high core count. 
Well, yeah, it's, we were basically adding clients as long as the resolver was kicking up. So usually the bottleneck was, uh, well, I would say, I would say in 100% cases, the bottleneck was CPU because we were sitting on a very, uh, very fast internet connection. So the network wasn't the problem. And uh, we just maxed CPU on all cores and then usually the response rate dropped down. So we knew that, okay, this is the maximum the resolver can handle on this particular hardware. I'm, I'm not sure if it answers the question. Uh, see if Puneet comes with a reply here. But I think, you know, I think it answers. Okay. Mostly, Good. yes. <laughs> Good. And um, so, and then we have a question from Alison Mankin. Can the tool test mixed transports? Yeah, it can. The, but the problem is that it doesn't have user interface, so you have to edit the source code to do that. <laughs> That's exactly yeah. the thing we want to Im implement before end of this year, hopefully. Okay. And um, I think with it, that we have uh, emptied the queue. Perfect. And, uh, <laughs> Yes, so uh, thank you very much, Peter. Yeah, and, you are welcome. Um, and I will attempt to stop sharing screen. It's sometimes, yes. okay, seems it works. So, and we move on to our next presenter, which is Bill Bellinger from CIRA, the Canadian CCTLD registry. And he will be presenting DNS processing in the cloud with PCAP2. Bill, please go ahead. All right, and just checking to make sure you can hear me, see me, and see my screen. Yes, I can see your screen and hear you very well. Great. All right, so hello, everyone. My name is Bill Belanger, and I'm a development team lead at CIRA, the Canadian Internet Registration Authority. Uh, thanks for joining me today to talk about our project PCAP2, what it is, why we did it, and what we discovered while working on the project. Uh, this project was in response to an issue that we encountered in late 2018 and caused us to rethink our PCAP engine architecture. As you can see, our three major goals were mainly focused around removing the Hadoop-based infrastructure and the systems surrounding it. But before we dive into the meat of our project, I'll first give you a little more background about CIRA and what we're doing. CIRA is the registry behind the .ca domain, so it's our job to manage that and keep it secure and available for all Canadians. As a nonprofit, our mandate is to build a trusted internet for all Canadians which involves working in a variety of other areas, such as internet policy and governance, as well as developing cybersecurity services to protect Canadians at home and at work. CIRA's DNS infrastructure has grown beyond simply hosting .ca. Our system is used to support other countries and TLDs with their domain registries, and now hosts an Anycast system for more than 250 top-level domains. So this is a diagram of our previous PCAP engine system. The ingestion engine is running a Java program that consumes the PCAP files and writes the data to a, a Hadoop cluster using the Avro format. The system then uses the Uzi workflow scheduler to rewrite the data into the Parquet format once a day, thus reducing the file size of the content. The Parquet data is later consumed by our business intelligence team to their data warehouse through their ETL processes using the Impala SQL interface provided by the Hadoop system. The VI team then uses the data in their warehouse to produce reports as needed. So the biggest issue with this system was the ingestion engine and it being a single point of failure. We also realized that after having the system in place for a few years, we were barely utilizing the power of the Hadoop cluster. So we had a decision to make. Do we try to use more Hadoop or less? As I alluded to earlier, a decision was forced upon us during the later part of 2018 when our infrastructure was used in a random subdomain abuse scheme. Our problem was the amount of traffic we received. The random subdomain generator was issuing 3,000 queries a day to each of 900,000 different subdomains. This large spike in traffic was a 220% increase in, and it completely backed up our data pipeline. We ended up having to delete some data so that we could clear up the pipeline again. The issues were patched within a day, but losing data always leaves a bad taste in your mouth. Once we had patched the system to better handle the spike, it didn't really require our attention anymore. And after a few months, the abuse stopped just as suddenly as it had appeared. Because of this event, we decided to redesign our PCAP data flow. 
enter our new ingestion engine, PCAP Chew. This engine liked to consume PCAPs, and as my little kids used to say at the time, the engine goes choo-choo. The goal was to swap out the ingestion and Hadoop section with the cloud-based solution. We ended up going with a two-stage process. First, the edge nodes would upload their PCAPs directly to the S3 data lake. This was done through curl and HTTP post. We would use AWS's serverless infrastructure called Lambda and custom Java code to convert the files into Parquet as they arrived in the data lake. Using AWS Athena, the BI team was able to submit SQL queries to retrieve the data directly from the Parquet files in the S3 bucket. We had a long discussion around whether or not we wanted to upload the raw PCAP files into the data lake, specifically around the cost. The decision was to push the entire PCAP into S3 for two reasons. Number one, we weren't sure how many resources PCAP2 would use on the edge. And number two, we wanted to maintain a proper source of truth, which was the full PCAP file. So this architecture removes the single point of failure that was the old ingestion engine, and it also removed any concept of hard drive capacity. With Athena's SQL-like interface for our BI team, there was practically no modifications they needed to make. And with all this in place, we were able to decommission the existing Hadoop infrastructure and convert our entire process to the mystical cloud. The project took slightly over four months of man hours of development and has been running smoothly for almost two years now. In fact, the project ran so smoothly that the next year in 2019, we got hit with the exact same random subdomain abuse, and we never even noticed. The dev team was only made aware of the abuse when we were contacted by a member of the BI team asking us why the traffic had suddenly dropped off. After some investigation, we realized we had been weathering the subdomain abuse for over two and a half months, and the new system handled it like it was just business as usual. Remember, this was a more than doubling of normal traffic counts for these TLDs. Now, all of that may seem all well and good, but everyone's got to be asking, how much does it cost? Running something in the cloud has got to be expensive, and processing all that data in the cloud, that can't possibly be a good idea. So I've collected some graphs from the first half of 2020. I specifically had to stop before July, because at that time we rolled out a new product, which would have inflated the numbers. The first graph shows the difference between compute and storage costs. As you can see, the actual compute costs, Athena and Lambda, which are the green and orange in that graph that you can barely see, they end up being less than 100 US dollars a month. The second graph is a further breakdown of the storage costs only. To provide some context to these graphs, we average about 20 terabytes of PCAP files per month. We keep the PCAPs for 30 days before moving them to glacier cold storage. That first 30 days of raw storage is the dark purple. The orange is the cold storage, which retains the files for another 120 days. After that, they are further relegated to Glacier Deep Archive storage and stored there permanently. This means that while our costs will technically continue to increase until we decide to delete the files from a deep archive storage, those costs are so small, they appear as some part of the other section in this graph, This is the green at the top. There were certainly some things we learned through this process. Firstly, AWS Lambda really didn't like downloading large PCAP files. Lambda allows for 200 megabytes of download space, so that meant that our PCAP files had to be limited to that size as well. This resulted in, a large, in large numbers of small Parquet files. This goes directly against the second lesson. Athena prefers small numbers of large files. Athena's performance is directly related to how many files it had to scan. This ended up making the Athena queries slow. Recently, we rolled out a new process that will periodically amalgamate the, small, the multiple small parquet files into large, larger parquet files, and then delete the smaller ones. While this process is still experimental, our BI team is reporting a greater than 100 times performance increase on their query times. The third lesson was that the serverless systems prefer to use what they call a warm start. This means that the server doesn't reinitialize every time an event is triggered. If your code is stateless, you would never even notice, but since our code downloaded the PCAP file into the temp directory, that temp di directory wasn't being cleared between executions. It took us a while to understand why the system would work sometimes, but not others. But once we realized the cause, we just updated our Java code to clear the temp space at the start of each run. 
This way, even if something went wrong and the file failed to delete, the next run would clean it up before starting. So what's on the horizon for this project? Our first goal is to process the data on the Anycast nodes themselves. The idea here is to utilize the processing power available at the sites at which the data is collected and convert the files from PCAP to Parquet before sending it to the S3 bucket. We are concerned about degrading the performance of the servers at the edge, so we've added a failsafe. Before converting a file, the system will check resource usage on the local machine. If it is deemed too busy, then it will simply push the PCAP file up to the S3 data lake to be processed in the old method. We actually have a prototype of this system working in the wild, and it's been going quite well. The system handles roughly 11,000 files a day. Most days, we have zero overflow events going directly to the, PCAP, uh, to the S3 data lake. And uh, I think our worst day, we saw 46 events, so 46 files. So with the introduction of the PCAP2 system, we've managed to improve our capacity and performance of our PCAP collection and processing. We've decommissioned an old system that required specialized knowledge to maintain. And most importantly, we've made the whole thing a set and forget process that handles 20 terabytes of data a month without batting an eye. Does anyone have any questions on what I presented? Thank you, Bill. And uh, so very quiet in the Q&A queue. Um, ah, here it comes. <laughs> Uh, Martin Wu Link asks, uh, very interesting, is there any of the code open source? So it's not yet, uh, but that is definitely something we've been talking about internally. Um, and uh, that's something I've personally been pushing for, but I'm not entirely sure how much traction that uh, initiative is getting. Okay. And, um... Yeah, so James Schenk asked the same thing. Do you plan to open source the system? I think we answered that one. Uh, James Richards asked, thank you, very interesting. Did you consider DNS tab file format? Uh, so we have talked about using that format. Uh, and um, what was the other one? CDNS or, or something like that. Um, yeah. We decided to stick with uh, PCAP for the moment. Uh, simply because um, it, it's what we knew and we were already changing enough things we didn't really feel like changing anything else. Okay. So it seems in the comments or questions here, uh, CDNS is winning. <laughs> we have Ryan Dixon and Peter de Vries asking about CDNS. So, um... <laughs> well, sounds like we know what the next step is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And we have Martin Bostels asking, uh, did you look at Entrada, which also supports Athena now? Uh, we did, uh, but I think at the time that we started this project, it didn't support Athena yet. Okay. Because I think our original uh, design was based pretty heavily on the way Entrada worked already with the, the Hadoop cluster. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then I have more votes for CDNS and uh, and for parquet files, actually. <laughs> so, um, uh, I think we got the message on the... Uh, <laughs> I think so. Oh, okay, we have uh, James Schenk uh, asking, how many event entries do you process per day? Uh, so, we get, a, with our... Um, with the, the prototype that I mentioned, because I've got better measurements on that, we do about 11,000 um, PCAP files a day. Um, and uh, it, when you say event, I don't know if you're referring to the overflow where the system is just too busy and it has to upload it directly, the PCAP file directly to S3. Um, so we get normally zero, uh, but on the really, really busy days, we get somewhere between 20 to 40. Mm -hmm. And uh, Robert Story asks, how did you uh, did cloud costs compare to previous in-house costs? So I don't actually have um, 
too much data on the in-house costs because it gets absorbed by uh, um, operations budget. Um, but uh, the the cloud costs, as I as I showed, are about seventeen hundred U.S. dollars uh, a month, and that is primarily because we are purposefully keeping the data out of cold storage for uh, a while while we're still sort of evaluating the system. We can certainly be much more aggressive um, with that, uh, that process, that scheme, and uh, put things in cold storage much faster. Uh, the other thing we can do is we can, uh, you know, as, as we're doing the experiment now, is uh, convert them to Parquet before writing them to S3, which would also greatly reduce the costs. We have uh, Martin asking, what is the time between sending PCAP from the edge to data in the warehouse? Yeah, so uh, while well, the data in the warehouse is a separate ETL process, so they run that once a day. Uh, but the data being available in the data lake, uh, so after processing and, and all that, um, it typically takes uh, about a minute and 30 seconds in the worst case. Um, and I've seen it. Um, much faster than that. Okay, that sounds fast. And, uh, so we have Martin again, and he, he asks, uh, no problem with privacy and putting your date, uh, DNS data in the cloud? Uh, so that was another long discussion that we had. Um, so we are a, a Canadian uh, registration authority, and uh, we are only hosting the data in uh, the Canadian uh, region of AWS. Um, and that uh, region has been uh, approved by the Canadian government for uh, uh, private storage. So although it is an ongoing discussion and a concern, um, we've sort of uh, trusted the Canadian government to do its due diligence and we've gone on their recommendation. Okay, James Shank asks, sorry, I'm more interested in the DNS packets processed per day over the PCAP file count. Can you ah, share the total okay. DNS packets processed per day? So um, I can I can give you queries per second because I, I have that measurement. Um, and uh, uh, I don't know about DNS packets uh, total, but uh, the queries per second, um, Across the whole system, this this data is processing about, um, on average, two hundred thousand queries a second, and uh, at spikes, it's gone up to I think three hundred and eighty. Okay. Okay. Chris Cherry asks, "What is your speed of searches for Athena?" Also, what is your time frame for parquet file? Uh, so we are uh, doing the parquet file stuff now. Um, uh, and it's, like I said, the, the minute 30 before it arrives in parquet format in the cloud. Um, so I, I'm not sure if that's the question you're what, asking. What, and then what, what the, time does it cover? Oh, um, so we, because we have to split them up according to file size, um, it's usually more uh, file size as opposed to time, but we are probably doing uh, one file every 40 seconds or so. So that's 200 megs every, every 40 seconds. Um, I think that's mm -hmm. about right, but I'd have to double check that. And then the question around uh, performance for Athena um, with the amalgamation that I mentioned earlier, uh, I think they are doing the entire ETL process in something like 14 minutes to pull an entire day's worth of data down to the warehouse. Okay, people, I'm cutting the queue now. We are already <laughs> over time. <laughs> so very popular talk. Apparently. And we have another question here from Roger Murray. Are you only using this model on .ca or are you doing this for any other CCTLDs? 
So we are using this on other uh, TLDs um, with their permission, obviously. Um, but uh, yeah, we do we do it for CA and we do it for some other TLDs as well. It's not rolled out to all of the TLDs we we host on our platform yet. Okay. And last question from Martin Wuling: What data from the DNS packet do you convert to parquet files? Uh, so that's a really good question. Um, we have specifically trimmed down the data that we convert uh, to only the stuff that was needed by the BI team for their reports. Um, but that was a purposeful and conscious decision. And it's something that we've uh, talked about expanding. Um, if we decide we don't want the PCAPs to be the source of truth anymore, then we would probably convert the entire DNS packet. And I, what the specific ones are, I don't have that offhand. It's, you know, pretty, pretty basic elements, I think. Okay. And with that, we uh, finish the, this session. Thank you, Bill. All right. Thank you. And, uh, uh, we now go over to a short break. Um, but even when we got over here a few minutes, I hope you all find that very interesting. And we will reconvene at uh, 17... 1700 UTC sharp. So we'll see you in 12 minutes. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. The, um, we continue our deep dive into DNS here. And uh, next up is Vincent, who I apologize to for not being able to say his last name, but he works at AFNIC and will tell us about their journey to ellipt elliptic stuff. Please, Vincent, start your presentation. OK. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you and see your presentation. OK, perfect. So and, and my name was perfect. I know it's always difficult to say that, but OK, it was perfect. So hello, everybody. My name is uh, Vincent Vigneron. I work for AFNIC. And I'm going to, uh, to give you a presentation today about our work to change DNSSEC algorithm for uh, all TLDs we operate. And first of all, um, a quick slide to present my company. So my company is a nonprofit association and this was founded in 1998. And we operate six CCTLDs. Uh, .fr is for France, but we also operate uh, .re, .pm, .tf, .yt and .wf. Uh, uh, it corresponds to some French uh, exotic uh, territories. And we are also backend registry for 12 GTLDs, like for instance, .paris, .jovh, .bzh. And we are also backend registry for a CCTLD, the, the .cn. .cn stands for Senegal, an African country. And we operate more than 3.5 million domain names. And we introduced the DNSSEC 10 years ago. In fact, the same day the route has been signed. We had some experiment before, but it was officially uh, introduced uh, 10 years ago. And for the moment, we have about 12% of domain names that have a DS published. Uh, before we start, uh, I'd like to, to spend just a minute to talk about the COVID-19 uh, impact on the project. In fact, that, that presentation was initially planned for the original, <coughs> excuse me, original 33 Orc meeting in Paris. But we had some issues, of course, during the lockdown. For instance, it was very difficult to get delivered during the lo lockdown. We had some uh, new equipment that we could not have. So we had to, to delay some uh, step of the project and we had to, to, to wait to before we started of course it was not possible to intervene in data centers uh, while of course if we had a, a major um, a major issue issue it would have been possible but it was very difficult to to move in france and travel and uh, of course our data centers are not close to our offices. They are spread uh, in those countries, so it was very difficult to go from one to, to the other. Uh, of course, it was 
impossible to have face-to-face -face key ceremonies. And of course, key ceremonies are mandatory. Uh, if you want to change a um, key algorithm, you have to produce new keys. So we couldn't have a key ceremonies. And so RSA to ECDSA rollover had to be delayed. Uh, some details about our infrastructure before uh, the project start. The NSSEC at AFNIC, uh, we use keys which are stored in uh, AEP Keepers HSMs. We also use Open DNSSEC to manage keys and BIND is used to sign zones. Uh, we chose to use both Open DNSSEC and BIND because when we started the, the project, uh, Open DNSSEC had a, a better uh, key management tool and uh, BAN knew how to deal with uh, uh, dynamic updates. So, which is not the case with Open DNSSEC. That's why we use both. Uh, but we had to, to create a link between BAN and Open DNSSEC, and it's provided by our homemade scripts. Our zones are dynamically updated, updated every 10 minutes. And we chose to use NSX3. And at the beginning of the project, we, when we started NSX, we changed several times per month the salt, which is no longer the, the case. And it's important to understand that keys and salt are not shared amongst TLDs. Each TLD uses its own set of keys. And in fact, it's the same thing for ethnic zones like nick.fr, ethnic.fr, they use their own keys and salt. And we have a KSK rover every two years and we use a standby keys. So two DS are uh, published in part one zone and uh, only one KSK is published. And we have a ZSK rover every two months. These are some details for um, about our first release of uh, DNSX. We started with OpenDNSX 100 and by 97, which was called uh, DNSX for humans. Uh, it was the very first version of binds that was user friendly for DNSX stuff, and it worked very it, it worked very well. Uh, we used. Um, 2048 bits KSK and 1024 bits ZSK with the standby keys. The DNS key set was signed with both keys, both KSK and ZSK. We only published SHA2 DS and uh, NSX3 is used with opt out. And a few months, a few months later, after the signature of the zone, we implemented RFC. Uh, 5910 uh, to integrate uh, DNSXing in uh, our EPP interface. So what happened in 10 years? Uh, at the beginning, we signed only six TLDs and now we signed 19 TLDs. We have uh, 20 HSM to operate. Uh, th there is no one HSM per TLD. We have multiple HSM because we have ones for our disaster recovery plan. We have ones for development, for testing, etc. And uh, we use load balancers. Uh, so we, ha we have uh, multiple HSM. Dur during these 10 years, we had hundreds of case care rollover and thousands of ZS care rollover and around 100 key ceremonies. It takes a lot of time. A key ceremony is not something you, you do in five minutes. We also uh, upgraded by 9.7 to by 9.11. And uh, recently, about two, two or three years ago, we decided to move from uh, ZSK and KSK with the front side to uh, KSK and ZSK of the same size. We chose to use 2048 keys. Uh, for the .fr, it was done lately because we had some performance issues. So we needed to, to wait to find a way uh, to uh, do that modification. And uh, we, we, it was possible because uh, of new HSM, which has more po powerful 
we were able to sign the dot fr in, in two, two years later uh, now the dnsk set is only signed is with ksk and uh, last year we introduced new ap keeper plus and of course we we started the uh, cdsa testing before uh, this project so why have we decided to go to cdsa now first of all uh, about one year ago uh, the, RFC, the rfc 8624 has been published and this rfc provides some guidance about dnssec algorithm and that should be used and the ecdsa has been has been promoted to must so it was um, a good signal for us to to go to ecdsa uh, next month it will be the end of life of open dnssec version one so we have to switch to open dnssec version two and in open dns version 2 the algorithm rollover is supported it was not the case in the first first ver previous version but now it's it's, it's the case uh, at the end of this year it's also the end of support of ap keeper models so we um, had to purchase new ones uh, ap keeper plus and these ones have ECDS available and uh, ECDSA is uh, the default choice for more and more registrars. If if you look uh, at the RSC 26, 24, and uh, what we have in .fr zone, uh, if you compare the, the status of the of the algorithm, algorithm eight and thirteen, which are now must uh you can see that there is an improvement between april and this month and there is an increase of uh, algorithm 8 and algorithm 13 and uh, for the moment the, the the one which is the most often used is algorithm 7 that's only because it's uh, used by ovh and ovh has been the registrar that um, has the first uh sign zones and uh, when st they started they use only this algorithm but now they start to, to migrate from algorithm 7 to algorithm 8 and 13. and this uh, graph that was provided by victor de Kovny, uh, at the beginning of the year shows that for the first time algorithm 13 is the most used than algorithm 8. So this was also a signal for us to, to say that we, we could go to ECDSN. And if you compare TLDs in root and RFC 2624, 86-24, you can see that in April, you only add 14 TLDs that use algorithm 13. There was already five uh tld's from ethnic here and now uh i just do that count today and there, there are 35 tld's that are signed with ecdsn we in fact we only have one concern it was the adoption of ecdsa in resolvers when we each time we decided we wanted to to go to 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 change the algorithm the question was already raised are you sure it's okay with um, resolvers and of course we, we don't have a, a final answer for that but if you look at this interesting page from nl labs uh you can see that algorithm 13 is as well supported as algorithm 8. so now it starts for us to 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 change and to to go to ecdsa so here is a infrastructure we have for ecdsa we had to upgrade um, open dnsec from version 1 to version 2. we also had to replace all our hsms uh from AP Keeper to AP Keeper Plus. And also we had to change the way we use bind and compile it in a different way. Okay, let's look um, 
of the, the consequences of each kind of upgrade. So first, let's start with the upgrade of OpenDNSSEC. With uh, OpenDNSSEC version 2, standby keys and concept is no longer supported. It was something experimental is version 1 of OpenDNSSEC, but I know we, we should not uh, have used that, but even if it was experimental, we, we use that for all our zones. So we had to remove that before upgrading to open DNSSEC version 2. Uh, uh, consequence was also that database structure is really different. Uh, we are not supposed to query the directly the database of open DNSSEC, but we do that for some kind of script we use to to compare data, to check uh, keys, etc. So that's something we use and we need. The key life cycle of, is more complex in OpenDNSSEC 2. Uh, command output has also changed. And we also had minor issues before version 2.16. But the, the good news is that the algorithm rover works fine. So for, for we, we had to, to modify our code and scripts to process keys for, for this upgrade. What, what were the consequences of the replacement of HSM? Uh, the first one is it's not fully compatible if you have both Keeper and Keeper Plus. Uh, we have a load balancing environment and it doesn't work as it is supposed to work. Uh, so we have had some issues with that. We have uh, lo lower performances with the last version of load balancer. It's under investigation with the provider. It's something that should be fixed, I guess. Uh, some default parameters have changed, so we had to check all our configuration when we decided to, to replace the HSMs. But uh, the good news is uh, for, for those of you who, who know um, this kind of HSM, the interface, the interface is really better and the performances are better and ECDSA is available. And the, the best is that now you can use a USB sticks instead of a smart cards to store applicative keys. Uh, it can be very painful to deal with the keys and smart cards. Now it's really, really fast. And of course, we needed uh, to make some modification in the tools we developed. And the last but not the least, uh, the modifications and the, conse the consequence uh, of the modification of the way we compile bind. Uh, now we use um, native mode. This was not the, the way we compiled bind before. And the problem is that for the moment, uh, it's under investigation with ISC, but we have very bad performances. And th that's the main reason why we have uh, do the algorithm rover for all the TLDs we operate, but the dot .fr, because the dot .fr is the biggest one. And the impact um, is very, very bad. It, is a, it, it takes too long, too much time to for the signature. So we, we decided to delay the signature of the dot .fr and we wait for a um, for better performance in, in by. But uh, I guess it, 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 should, it could be fixed very fast. Uh, and another thing we have to, to take into account is that the content of files like dot .key and private have changed. So transition might be tricky because you cannot just change your version of bind. You also have to change the key files. Uh, DNSSEC from key from label, it's a command we, we, we use in many scripts and uh, the interface has changed with, um, with the way we compile the tool. But the good news is once it has been migrated, it works as expected. So we had to make many modifications with the uh, improvement of bind. We had to modify the process to compile and deploy, uh, and deploy bind. Uh, we had to modify the tools we developed and we had to write some specific script to make the migration of keys in the new formats. Uh, we could not do that by end because we have hundreds of keys. And for the dot .fr .re, which are our biggest zone, we had to find some workaround. 
So everything is ready. So now we can do the, the rollover. And we started, uh, we decided to start with the zone, uh, with our own zone, like, like nick.fr, zone master.fr. Because the configuration is not exactly the same that for the TLDs, this configuration is very is simpler. You, we only use for this case, open DNSX, there is no uh, link and script needed for bind and open DNSX. So we started with uh, this simple case and it worked very fine. Then we do a rollover for the sandbox and pre-production infrastructure. Then the small TLDs in production, and we finish with the TLDs we operate as the backend registry. Um, with DNSVs, let's look the impact of the algorithm rollover on zone side. Uh, this is what we have at the beginning of the project. As you can see, there are two DS records in the route. One for the KSK, which really resign the DNS key set, and one for a key that is not published, a standby key. And we also have a ZSK, which is used to sign the zone, and a standby ZSK, which is just published. Uh, then we migrate from OpenDNSSEC1 to OpenDNSSEC2, so we have to remove the standby keys. And we have a more simpler configuration with just one KSK and one ZSK. Then uh, the algorithm will start. And for this step, that's what uh, bothered you a little because we, we were afraid of the increase of the size of the zone. Uh, for, for this step, we have to sign the zone with the uh, old key, the, the RSA key and the ECDSA key. So we introduce a new KSK of algorithm 13 and the new ZSK of algorithm 13 also. And they both, they both sign the zone, this ZSK and ZSK. Then once we have both algorithm 8 and algorithm 13 signing the zone, we can publish the corresponding DS of the KSK of algorithm 13 in parent zone. After one or two days, it, de it depends on the TTL of the zone, uh, we can remove the DS in parent zone of the key of algorithm, algorithm 8. And then the final step, there, there is only uh, algorithm 13 keys remind. So what is the impact? On uh, the just a timekeeper. We have four minutes left until the start of the Q&A session. OK, thank you. Uh, these are some size considerations during the process. If you query uh, as a reference, here is the size of an answer when we had RSA plus standby keys. Uh, this is the same answer without stand standby keys. It's um, the standby keys add 25% of size in the response. Uh, then when we add RSA and SDSA, the size is more or less the same that we had when we started the project with standby keys. And when we only have a CDSA, uh, the, the response is three times smaller than what we had when we start the project. If we look at the TLD in, in the TLD's route, uh, the ECDS signature, the response with ECDS signature is four times smaller than the average. And you have some TLDs with a very big answer, like uh, 3,000 3, bytes. Here is the uh, increase of size of the zone file when uh, it's it signed. So when we use only RSA, uh, you can see that there is a, an important increase of the size of the, of the file when it's signed. It's more than, the, more than the double of the zone file before it's signed. 
du during algorithm rollover, when the zone file is signed with RSA and ECDSA key, there is not a very big increase because you just add uh, ECDSA signatures, they are very small, and uh, all other DNSSEC um, resource record re related to, to DNSSEC, like signature, like NSEC3, DS, etc., are already there. So the increase is very, very small. And when you have ECDSA only, uh, the differ difference is very, uh, of, of, of course, um, there is an increase of the, of the size of the, of the zone, but as you can see, it's more or less plus 60%, while we had uh, plus 150% uh, with RSA. So we can conclude. So now we have uh, one of our structures that has been updated and nothing, and nothing broke uh, fully for the moment. Uh, 18 TLDs are now ECDSA uh, signed. And there is only one left, as I already told. It's a dot .fr because we have to fix some performance uh, issues. TLDs holders were happy with that change, mainly because they had uh, almost nothing to do, except uh, click when they receive uh, Yana um, email saying, do you agree or no? And so the .sn SN was very happy because they are the first African TLD to move to ECDSA. And for the, for the next challenge we have to, we will meet, uh, there is a change uh, of bind from version 9.11 to version 9.16 because we always use LTS versions and 9.16 is the next LTS version of bind. And we also want to do the algorithm rollover for the dot .fr when it will be possible and we will have better performances in signing process. And of course, we plan to, and we need to remove our common in our code. Thank you. Any question? I'm on Thank time. You, yes, very much on time. And yes, we have questions, um, but we start with the, uh, a not question from Benno, and Benno Owen dear, uh, sa says, uh, thank you very much, Vincent. Uh, a comment here, not a question. We need to extend the key life cycle, make it more complex with additional states to allow logical reasoning, whether the key is partially known, globally known. With this extended key state, uh, OpenDNSSEC Enforcer is able to make uh, uh, safe key state changes and even start emergency key rollovers. Okay, and uh, for anybody who is not uh, that uh, knowledgeable about uh, person, uh, Benno yeah, is uh, the to, to is be, in charge be, of the Open DNS Sec uh, development. Okay, so. to to be uh, crystal clear, I didn't complain about the fact. Um, life cycle is more is more complex but uh, as it adds steps in the cycle we had to make many modifications in our course but of course i agree it's it's better now than it was before and uh, we have a question from uh, guillaume and guillaume uh, uh, from uh, foundation restela the dns in luxembourg as how did you perform the migration from OpenDNSSEC 1.4 to 2.1? Did you use the provided script or applied a manual export, perhaps after some key material housekeeping? Uh, the migration from OpenDNSSEC 1 to OpenDNSSEC 2 was, uh, for the OpenDNSSEC part, it was straightforward. It was very easy. There, there is a script that works fine, uh, which is provided with the distribution, and uh, we had nothing special to do uh, for this specific point. Of course, we had to integrate the modification of uh, OpenNSSEC 2 in our tools, but for the mi migration step, it was really straightforward. Good. But of course, uh, if uh, you need more details, uh, don't hesitate to send me an email. We can share uh, on that. No problem. 
Yes. Joe Ebley asks, did you see a change in query behavior following the algorithm role? For example, did the smaller DNS key response seem to have any positive reaction from the resolver population? No, we did not notice nothing special. Uh, it was not better, but it was not worse. <laughs> that was the most important okay. thing. We we were afraid uh, to have bad response size, times, etc. But it we didn't notice ba bad things. That was uh, the most important. But per per perhaps yeah. we we we. We didn't study that so that, that close. Um, I'm closing the uh, uh, Q&A line now because we have a few in the line now and uh, otherwise we go over time again. So uh, Jaromir Talir asks, have you considered changing maximum UDP packet size in configuration of your secondaries or the maximum DNS key size during rollover lower than the maximum in configuration? Uh, no, I don't remember what is the maximum size now, but uh, no, we had no consideration on, on that specific to that project. No. Mm -hmm. And uh, we follow up this with a question from Dimitri. And he asked, um, we in .ua had also completed a transition to ECDSA and I no had noticed dramatic decrease of TCP query traffic. Did you? No, not yet. We, we, that, that's what, that's what were so surprising because of course we were, we were waiting for some changes. And in fact, it seems it changed nothing in our case. Good. And then the last one is a comment again from Benno comment to migration, wait for the new ODS 2.1.7 with better migration scripts. And he's sorry about the views for the Q&A window. <laughs> okay, folks, with us, uh, thank you, Vincent. Thank and, you. Uh, and we go to the, um, to the last uh, talk of today, which is Sarah Dickinson. And she's talking about DNS privacy. There must be an app for that. Sarah, please go ahead. Yes, I can hey. see your screen. Uh, and can, I can can, you. you can hear me. Okay, brilliant. Thanks very much. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk a bit about DNS privacy today. Um, I'm firstly going to give a very short review of what's happening on the client side with DNS privacy, focusing just on dot and do. Uh, quickly touch on what's next for the client side and then have a lightning fast whip through uh, the new GUI that we have for Stubby. Now on the server side we know that things are very encouraging, there's lots of implementations now, there's lots of services available, there's the encrypted DNS deployment initiative, there's lots of things happening there. I'm not going to go into any detail on that in this talk. What I'm going to focus on here is the client side where the picture is much more varied and you could actually argue it's more fragmented because we have browsers, we have desktop systems, mobile systems, routers, lots of things happening. So I'm going to give a highly simplified, non-exhaustive overview of the current state of the client side. So to start with the desktop browsers, we all know that Firefox has been doing Doe for a couple of years now. Their current policy is that it's turned on by default in the US to one of its trusted resolvers. There are currently three in that list. Um, otherwise, a user has to go and explicitly configure it. And there are efforts within Firefox that will try and detect managed environments where there are filters or policies in place and disable DOE. In the last year, Chrome has caught up and Chrome now has DOE capabilities. However, Chrome itself is using a slightly different policy in that they're employing the idea of an auto upgrade to the currently used resolver if it is in a fixed list that they are managing. There's currently eight resolvers in that list. Edge, which is now based on the uh, Chromium code base, therefore also can support DOE. But again, they're currently managing that list differently. They have three resolvers there but they've said that they're actively in the process of trying to figure out what resolvers should be in that list and how they will manage it. Um, and Brave is also in that state where they're about to expose it and trying to figure out what to do. 
So the take home here is really that Doe is becoming a very standard feature in browsers, but the details of how the defaults and the, use and the resolver configurations work do differ. In terms of desktop systems, um, I think it's very notable that Windows in the last year has started to implement Doe natively and so offers it in its system config options. It's only available in Windows Preview at the moment, but it is coming. Uh, while I'm not aware of any moves on their native API, um, what's also noticeable is that there aren't any GUI apps available if you want to do anything outside the system config. In the last month, Cloudflare have released a beta of their app, but that I believe requires you to use the Cloudflare resolvers. And the only other thing I can find for Windows is simple DNS crypt. In terms of macOS, um, there is as yet no option in the system config, but what Apple have done is they've made a very extensive change to their native API, which allows applications to do some very fine grained configuration of how they want to encrypt Do and Dot. And that actually makes it quite easy to create apps that control the system level uh, resolution to enable encrypted uh, DNS. There are a few GUI apps out there, not that many. Um, and in terms of Linux, System Resolve D has natively supported DOT since 2018. And I'm not aware of any native API or GUI apps on Linux. If anybody knows of them, please let me know. If we look at the picture on mobiles, um, Android has supported DOT opportunistically in its system config since 2018. Um, I'm not aware of a native API, but there are numerous apps that you can use on your mobile device. And notably, just in the last month, Android added Do support to Chrome on Android. So that's available now. And iOS has a picture similar to MacOS. It's not in the system config yet, but apps can take advantage of it through this API. This is really a reference slide just to illustrate the fact that for embedded devices, uh, for example, if you open WRT or Pi Hole or something like that, it is also possible to encrypt your DNS. And most of them provide official documentation of how to do that with a combination of components, which often include stubby and bound and some sort of HTTPS proxy. So these options are available. So we can see that we've got quite a picture in terms of implementations and deployment. Um, I'm going to briefly just mention the fact that now the thing that is consuming attention and time is the decision about how to do resolver discovery and how to choose between the resolvers that you discover. Now, add, the ad working group at the IETF and its predecessors have been working on this for a year. They are still actively working on how to understand the use cases, which specific use cases they should deal with, how auto upgrade might work, authentication mechanisms. And I think it's fair to say that um, the solutions to this are some way off. It's a work in progress. I'm not going to go into the details of this in this talk, but in the last few slides, what I'll do is show you a GUI that could be used in the interim until we have some of these auto discovery mechanisms. So, I'll talk about a project we've been working on recently, which is a GUI for Stubby, and we're initially focusing on Windows. To remind you what Stubby is, it's a privacy enabling stub resolver. It runs as a daemon listening on localhost, and I'm calling it a smart.proxy because it's based on the GetDNS library. So under the hood, it has a plethora of DNS options, including the option to do full DNS validation as a stub. It was originally developed as a cross-platform command line tool. We built a GUI prototype for it in 2018, um, but we're now turning our attention to Windows because it is obviously, in terms of the global population, the, the largest user base. Our work on this actually predates the announcement by Windows of their native DOT support, but we still think it complements it. Uh, sorry, their native DOT support. But we still think what we're doing can complement it and extend it in a way by looking at the GUI and the concepts of usable security. We've done four main things under this project. Uh, this project was largely funded by the Comcast Innovation Fund. So I want to say a huge thank you to them for funding DNS Privacy to do this. Um, the first piece of work we did was we moved GetDNS to the CMake build system, which meant it could natively build on Windows. So if you're so inclined, you can actually go and build it in Visual Studio. Because of this, we were able to get, get DNS added to the VC package 
Windows Package Manager. And this means that in the absence of a native API on Windows, applications can now very easily actually encrypt their own DNS by using GetDNS. We've also um, improved Stubby so that it will run as a fully fledged Windows service. And we've been developing the GUI, which we've built with Qt. And I'll just show you a handful of screenshots uh, of what that GUI looks like at the moment. So the initial landing page for the GUI looks like this. So what we've tried to do here is provide background information and links so users can find out a lot more about what this is doing should they want to. If they want a cleaner interface, they can hide all that information. And so in this mode, we're trying to uh, make it look like a, a VPN with just one large on off button. So users who are happy with the defaults can simply hit go and it will work. We do display what network they're currently on and what profile they're using, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, so the simplest thing to do is just to hit the on button and your DNS is encrypted. If you're more interested in the defaults, you can come to the Network Profiles tab. We ship the Stubby GUI with three profiles, which the user can then go on and configure. We have an untrusted profile, which will do strict opt to your configured resolvers. We have a trusted profile, where the intention is it will do opportunistic dot to the network resolvers. And we have a hostile profile, and the intention there is that that could fall back to DOE if dot was blocked. We provide the minimum number of settings we think provides the most flexibility here and nothing more in this mode. We have a list of servers and the important thing here is that if the user wants to find out more about a specific server, they can go to the website and look at things like the details of the privacy policy. They can then, if they don't want to use the default, which is untrusted at the moment, they can then come into this tab and configure a specific profile for a specific network. Um, so they can customize this as, as much as they would like. Um, the other thing we have is a utilities tab, which means that for troubleshooting and for more advanced users, you can see details of exactly what's going on, some logging um, and, and do some extra actions. So the status of the GUI at the moment is we've just done an alpha release. The code is on GitHub, it's all open source. The installers and the documentation is on DNS privacy. Those are links you can follow to see that. The beta release should be coming shortly. It is a work in progress. Um, we would like to add a couple more important features to this. One is a probe mode, so that in a specific environment, users can probe the entire set of resolvers, check their connectivity to each one, and also see any measurable properties that those servers have before they select them. And obviously a custom profile and an expert mode for editing the config. So this is very much ongoing work. We've got lots of ideas about what we might want to do with this and we'd really like feedback on the usability of it. So if you're interested uh, or would like to contribute or collaborate, please do get in touch. Um, that's everything. There's much more information on DNS privacy if you're interested. And with that, I will wrap up and hope we have time for a few questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, right now, there is no questions in the Q&A list. See, I'm, I'm between uh, people in the social, so. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, but. Um, so let's see here. Um, yeah, so. Oh, here we go. Great. Uh, Joey Zalazar asks you how to get in touch and is there a Git repository? Yeah, so I've, um, the code is on there. Feel free to file issues or feature requests there or email me directly. That's fine. My, my email's on the slide set. So either of those things. Good. And uh, Benno says, uh, thank you. You mentioned native DOE support in Windows. Do you think there is a market for DOE stubby? I, I, I do because I, I think it's useful to have the flexibility to be able to cater for environments where port 853 is blocked. Um, and uh, so, so I think it's, it's, 
important to provide that option. And in some respects, I think users are hearing more about DO than about DOT. So some of them might be more comfortable using it just because it's it's gained that bit of a higher profile. And if they're used to having configured it in a browser, for example, then they may feel more comfortable using it in Stubby. So I think limiting Stubby to just DOT uh, would, would be a mistake. I think it's better to have that extra option. Uh, Joey Zalazar says, excellent work, thank you. Thanks, Joey. And so says Pano. <laughs> <laughs> and um, with that, my list is empty and I say thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Let me stop sharing. And, uh, I say thank you to everybody for listening in and I give the word back to uh, Keith, I think. Thank you, Ulrich. And, um, Thank you for all this afternoon's speakers. Um, quick wrap up. Um, we're doing a social event which starts in just over 10 minutes. That's a separate Zoom room and it's a meeting rather than a webinar. So you'll be able to chat openly. Um, there's the details. Uh, we restart work 32 tomorrow um, at 1300 on Tuesday. Uh, we'd like to know what you thought about the meeting. Um, you can rate the talks. You can do that in real time um, as, as the um, workshop progresses, that's at rate.dnsorg.net. And there's also um, SurveyMonkey for feedback on the um, logistics and format of the meeting. Um, the ORC member AGM starts um, three hours after the start of ORC 33, 1600 tomorrow. Um, there's still time for you to register for that if you're an ORC member. Um, I'd like to thank Verisign as our um, sponsor, uh, as our patron for workshops for this year, and NS1 as the um, late breaking sponsor for um, ORC 33. Uh, don't forget that NS1 um, have a, if you fill in their survey, there's a chance to win swag. Um, and um, just thank you to everybody today. Um, and we will um, we will restart, uh, see you in the social shortly, and uh, we will restart the uh, content again tomorrow. Mm-hmm.